me just a note before we start the video. Uh, something happened during the live recording and the first portion of the, the video got lost. It's not really too much information. I think it starts right when, when I start covering the, the permaculture videos. Uh, but I just thought I'd let you know in case you're wondering why it kind of starts at an awkward place. So that's why. I'll enjoy the rest of the video. Thanks. Uh, so anyway, they have... Um, uh, in growing power, they, they, they heat a number of their greenhouses, or at least they did. It, it seems like they're defunct at this point, unfortunately. But when they were in, in full swing, they heated a number of their greenhouses just using compost because they got that balance right. And you can use it to heat water enough to have a hot shower, which we're going to talk about uh, in the video after that. These, these, these two videos coming up are pretty short. And then we're going to get into a longer one. We're going to look at Mark Shepard, who is a, a Wisconsin permaculturist and his method of STUN, which is an acronym for Sheer Total Utter Neglect. And that's how he acclimatizes new seedlings of various species that he's trying to uh, work up to have certain different qualities. He's doing plant breeding. And by doing the STUN technique, he puts them out in the field. And if they survive, that, that shows that they're hardy to the local climate. It's a way of filtering out stuff that's not as well suited, basically. So that'll be the third video we get into. And then perhaps we'll move and move on to rocket mass heaters, which is another one that's that's a favorite topic of permaculturists. But let's let's start here with compost, uh, hot compost to be exact. There's, there's many different ways to do composting, and this is just one of them. Uh, so as always, this is an educational space. Uh, there are no dumb questions except ones that derail discussion or you don't ask. So I'm, I'm always happy to do my best to, to help you understand uh, whatever it is that we're covering. So just look at me as a resource and I'll do my best to answer that question. If I don't know it, I'll try and find the answer uh, wherever I can. But let's, let's, let's start now with hot composting. So anyway, uh, think of it like, I, I've heard of it this way before. So the carbon part that's that's like the logs on a fire the the slow burning stuff that's going to sustain you thank you so much uh army 980t for the follow we're talking about permaculture tonight so uh, if you have any questions about what we're we're learning about right now we're doing hot compost uh, feel free to ask so anyway uh the way that i've heard of hot composting and just good composting uh described a good rule of thumb is if you think of building a campfire. So you have your large logs, those are your slow burning things. They sustain the fire over a long time. That is your carbon. And then you have your matches and your kindling, the stuff that really gets the fire going quick but burns out quickly as well. That's your nitrogen stuff. So if you think of it that way. <laughs> All right, cool. So you've nominated yourself. Um, I'm going to have to open that up a little bit. Why is it not showing me my stuff? Bam, there's the one. So anyway, we're going to continue on learning about some hot compost. Here's carbon to nitrogen ratio of some materials. Anything below 30 to 1 ratio is considered green, and anything above 30 to 1 ratio is considered brown. Some of green <laughs> So a question from uh, Sabalord Ballo. Sabalord Ballo. Okay. Do I have a permaculture some marijuana? Uh, no. In, in my, I, I live in an apartment. I don't I mean, you can see some of my plants behind. In fact, I wonder. I'm going to pull up the full screen again for one second. Oh, no. Oh, I'm in the way of it. Okay, so I have, right behind me, I have a hibiscus tree that we got recently. Uh, they were at deep discount. I guess the garden center was getting rid of them. And it finally is, is starting to put out flowers. So I have hibiscus in my, my house. I also have in uh, the, the living room, which is our largest south-facing windows, I have uh, a number of edible things. I have some mint. Let's see what else is there. Oh, there's the passion vine, which has taken over a good chunk of, of the window. They grow incredibly fast. It's, it's, I planted it this year. It was in like February, March, something like that. And already it's up, banging against the ceiling. 
Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't fruit for a year and a half. So I got to wait a while on on that yield. Uh, let's see. I have some aloe. That's that is technically edible. Often, more often than not, has a medicinal use. Oh, hello, Strin. How are you tonight? Uh, we are we are learning about hot compost right now. How's your night been going? Um, so yeah, so I, I do have a number of edible plants that that grow in my uh, and medicinal plants that that grow in my apartment, but uh, no marijuana. It's not yet legal in my state, unfortunately. Minnesota is lagging even the the North Midwest. So I, I believe it's it's legal in Michigan, and I know that it's legal in Illinois, but uh, we are falling far behind. Happy to hear that you're doing well, Strin. Um, so yeah, so we were just learning, if you're just joining us, about the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio in a good hot compost. And these hot composts, just to give you an idea, can get up over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the one that they had showed at the beginning clip was at 128 degrees. So it's hot enough to kill pathogens and stuff like that. Oh, you're multitasking. So if you're listening, wonderful. Well, I hope you... Uh, get some good food for thought while you're you're doing your other activities. So here, here, here's here's some good examples of what is in the oh, and they so they put carbon to nitro, nitrogen ratio, uh, but then they switched which is which. The brown is the carbon, so the the brown really should have been on the left side, and the green is the nitrogen, so that should have been on the right side. So just switch it around in your mind if you can. But remember that the green, that's the nitrogen. So uh, 30 to 1. Uh, so, so, so 30 parts for, for one full thing. So here's, here's a good mixture of what the green could be. Grass clippings, 17 parts. Coffee grounds, 20 parts. Coffee is a great. You can go to like your local coffee shop in, in many cases, and they will save the grounds for you. All you got to do is provide them some sort of a container to set them aside in. And as long as you keep coming to pick them up, they'll, they'll save you coffee grounds. But they're a great source of nitrogen. Then you have manure, 20 to 1, and veggie scraps, 25 to 1. So all that comes together to create one part, your one part of, of uh, green, the, the nitrogen. And then brown, let's, let's take a look at the, the brown part, the carbon. Materials include grass clippings, which is 17 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio, while coffee grounds... Oh, I see. He's putting the, the ratios of how much um, carbon to nitrogen there is. So, so I guess ideally you want to have a, a lower ratio. And manure is 20 to 1, and vegetable scraps is 25 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Some of the brown materials include dead leaves, which is 60 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Straw and hay is 90 to 1. Paper and cardboard is 175 to 1, and hmm. sawdust is 500 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Two parts green to one part brown is a general rule for creating a compost pile. To further understand the ratios, let's take grass clippings and dead leaves as an example. Take two parts of grass clippings, whether it's two buckets or any measurement, to one part dead leaves. This means we have two of the 17 to 1 carbon to nitrogen content and one of the 60 to 1 carbon to Oh, yeah, Strin has heard that human hair has nitrogen. That's also very true. Uh, my, my wife and I have actually uh, put stray hairs in, into our, uh, our various container pots that we have in our apartment here. I don't know how well it, it does, but, but supposedly it, it works. Uh, uh, I mean, you got to be a little bit careful because I think hair is, is one of those things that's a little bit harder for bacteria uh, to break down. So you don't want to just be like carpeting stuff with it because it's going to take a while. Uh, and the same is true of other additives like like eggshells. Eggshells are an excellent source of calcium and you can bake them to kill any pathogens and make them easier to grind up. And then you just grind up the shells and that's a good additive for calcium. But it does take a long time for it to, to break down into the soil. But yeah, definitely human hair has nitrogen. Do nitrogen content. After adding these up, we have 94 to 3 carbon to nitrogen content. Now let's divide 94 by 3, which results in 31.33 to 1 carbon to nitrogen content, which is right where we want to be. However, adding just a little bit of sawdust will greatly increase carbon content because of 500 to 1 ratio of carbon in the sawdust. So use sawdust very sparingly. I use just a little bit of sawdust just to be on the safe side, not to have a smelly comp. You know what? These are all rules of thumb too, and you're going to adjust as you go along. So if, if all these numbers are are seeming a bit daunting to you, 
don't worry so much. You can always experiment with adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that until you get the desired result. And eventually it'll be like like uh, basically baking anything, uh, or, or I guess it's more like cooking than baking. You'll, you'll learn to feel your way through and know when you, when you need to adjust and what things you need to add to it to, it, to adjust in one way or another. Compost. Never compost dairy and meat. These products will create a very bad smell and attract rodents and flies. <laughs> and, and that's very important. Uh, so no milk, no, no meat of any kind, uh, no oils either. Don't put like your bacon drippings in there or anything like that. Um, and, and limit the amount of bones and uh, other very hard materials that you would add to this sort of a compost because again, they, they take a long time to, to break down. But we'll get to in, a, in another video a way that you can dispose of these with what's called vermicomposting. So we take different, uh, well, they're the larvae of bugs, and they will go through the stuff with no problem. The, the main problem with the milk and the, the meat and stuff is it tends to rot before it ever breaks down into compost. So it just, it just smells terrible. And it's not necessarily going to be dangerous because, again, we're getting the temperature up really high, high enough to, to be above. If you've ever worked in food service, it, it would be above safe uh, food handling temperatures at, at its very height. Uh, so that's not the worry. The worry is more that it just it rots and it doesn't smell good. I also add coffee grounds to my compost pile since coffee grounds are very fine and decompose quickly. Coffee grounds can, however, create a compact compost pile, so I add toilet paper rolls to provide aeration to the compost pile. Toilet paper rolls help to provide aeration and also make the compost pile lighter. Completely mix and pile all the material. Make sure the pile is at least 3 feet wide and 3 feet tall to be effective. Water the pile completely when done. Water heavily so that the water starts to come out of the sides of the compost pile. After one week, the pile starts to heat up and all the organic material starts to decompose quickly. Keep the pile moist by watering the pile every two to three days and aerate the pile by turning the pile every three to five days. Turning the compost pile provides aeration to the compost pile and help to break up the material. When turning, move the outer material on top of the compost pile into the middle of the new pile. After two weeks, the compost pile will start to heat up further. I've had this compost pile for about two weeks now, and I'll be adding more coffee grounds to this compost pile. I'm adding coffee grounds because everything in this compost pile is turning brown. Even the grass is turning brown. So there's a lot more carbon in this compost pile. I want to add more nitrogen so it heats up even further. You don't want to add any big material to this compost pile at this point. You want to add very fine material, and coffee grounds are just perfect. And so again, he's making it seem... Like it's more of an exact science than it than it really is. You're, you're more checking to see what the results are, and then adjusting accordingly. So it, it's that uh, that permaculture principle: observe and interact. So don't just assume because you followed some recipe that it's going to come out in a certain way. You, you have to keep checking it and and adjusting as you go. And if you do that, you'll feel your way through, and you'll you'll get the results you want eventually. Um, and really. I would, my advice would be this, more than anything, this just takes more practice than it does study, you know. Once you have the basics down, if you just get out there and start trying it, you can just see how things go. And, and uh, I think that's going to be one of the best teachers for you with this technique. The temperature of compost pile should reach around 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 54 to 60 degrees Celsius. I have a thermometer here to check the temperature of the compost pile. I'm inserting the thermometer into the pile and the temperature starts to rise. The temperature rises quickly because of the heat in the compost pile. The temperature of my pile hits around 128 degrees Fahrenheit or 53 degrees Celsius, which is acceptable. My pile is not heating up to 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit because my compost is a little bit heavier on the carbon side. I like it this way so that there is no foul smell in my compost pile. After one month, the compost decomposes further. It is still heating up, but not as much as before. The maximum temperature my pile is now reaching is around 123 degrees Fahrenheit. After two months, the compost is almost ready and does not need to be turned any further. 
After two and a half months, the compost cools down and the worms move into the compost pile and further decompose the organic material by making worm castings in the process. After three months, the compost is fully decomposed and turns into rich black decomposed material. This compost makes great addition to raised beds and does wonders when growing vegetables. If you ever had a failure in gardening while growing any kind of vegetable, make or buy compost and add it generously to your garden and you will definitely see good results. So this is it. This is how you make hot compost and I hope you can turn your grass clippings and dead leaves into this rich organic compost. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in another video. So there you have it, a pretty good overview of, of some of the basics of making a hot compost. Now we're going to look at one of the applications of hot compost, and that is heating water for a shower. Let me show you something really unusual. That's our, our good friend Jeff Lawton again, one of the, the foremost uh, permaculture practitioners of the world. Here's a compost heap with heat that we're using to heat water for showers. This is free. Going for a shower now. Oh, go right ahead. This is pyrolysis. This is the heat of the organisms in the heap, heating the hot water in the plastic pipe, the irrigation pipe that's inside the compost heap. 150 meters of hose, heats the water. It gives you a five minute shower. Five minutes later, it's hot again. A five minute recharge, a wonderful system lasts for six to eight weeks of free hot water and at the end of it you have two cubic meters of high quality fertilizer here it is we've got it covered up so it doesn't get too wet in the rain and the heat is inside there as i go in if i go in far enough i'll get to the actual hot water pipes and there's the steam coming you can start to see a bit of steam coming out there and if you make a big enough heap You'll get hot water for six months and you'll grow all your food for a year on the size heap. So at a 10 metre heap, Jean Pan, the famous researcher on, on compost and, and, and heating hot water, famous Frenchman, Jean Pan wrote the book Another Kind of Garden and he ended up researching on compost heat. He made heaps that were 10 cubic metres in size and heated the house, the house central heating system, the radiators, for six months of the year and grew a year's supply of food on the 10 meters of compost every year. Great system. The power of compost couldn't be better. Basic physics, it's physics and biology in partnership together, working as a unified system. I'm here with Mark Shepard. You won't believe this farm. We got to walk around here a little bit last night. This is absolutely amazing. I found Mark through Jeff Larton, through the stun <laughs> method. You remember that? I sure like do. Three years ago. Yeah. Sheer, total, utter neglect. And I guess we have to clarify that a little bit. It's not like sheer, total, utter neglect. It's strategic. <laughs> you got to know when okay. You can neglect something totally and when not to. Okay. But um, part of the whole overall gist of the story is I got bit by the permaculture bug probably way back in 1986, I think, <clears throat> when I first encountered uh, a clip from a um, like an Australian public television series, The Global Gardener. You can find it on YouTube these days. And in there, uh, Bill Mollison said that by observing nature and imitating those systems, we can create systems, food-producing systems that that are. Um, uh, ecologically sound and economically profitable and I thought to myself well that's that's it that's like the holy grail of, of agriculture and civilization is if we can design systems that are ecologically sound there's no problems except for what you'd find naturally normally on planet earth uh, and then if they're economically profitable and you pay your bills with it you know all yeah. the better through a long story my wife Jen and I we eventually uh, got a piece of property in southwest Wisconsin 110 acres of land and when we got here much of it looked like this over here. Is this your neighbor? This is the neighbor. Okay. This is uh, this is 60 acres of right now it's corn, soybeans and uh, hay. So about a third of it was in uh, abandoned corn stubble and two-thirds of it was was grass that was grazed as close as this lawn if not closer. So, so it was a very degraded landscape. Erosion gullies through several of the different valleys that go down through it. And in 20 years, by following natural principles, by observing nature and imitating natural plant communities and going through the successional process, 
strategically yeah <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten to a system now that we're we're 98 percent um, perennial whereas all of the uh, products coming off the farm um, are they keep growing back year after year after wow. year and we actually do produce like our own food it's not really all that <laughs> difficult if you actually design a system to do that and it's not going to happen with two or three berry bushes in the backyard you know we uh, we're big people <laughs> we eat a lot and so uh, you know we uh We've been a commercial operating farm since then, first selling certified organic produce. Wow. And then as the different layers of uh, uh, production came along, we've sold, bought and sold everything throughout the years. Uh, right now, the big, the big ones are the produce, the uh, nursery, and now that I've gotten gray hair in my chin and stuff like that, I do a lot of teaching and designing for other folks. But let's go walk around my yeah. place and we'll yeah, see some uh, things. Okay, so your, your neighbor, does he absolutely think you're nuts? Um, Soy? Yeah, probably. And this Perennial. Is all, this is all GMO soy and corn. Yeah. It's the BT corn and, and uh, Roundup Ready soy. They have to drive this big, huge $100,000 tractor across that field. What's so, your most expensive piece of equipment? Most expensive piece of equipment um, is actually the tractor. Are we talking uh, $100,000 tractor? No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, a thousand bucks. It had a, uh, a seized engine. Why on earth would you buy a tractor with a seized engine? Okay. Because then for another thousand bucks, I could get one with a um, uh, destroyed transmission. Uh, and then you have the neighbor swap the two, and now you get a whole complete tractor. Nice. Um, we can go down the other end where we'll get better sunlight for the camera. Okay. Part of what permaculture teaches us is we are to observe. Yes. Learn the system conditions. What makes the system work, whether it's... Uh, highly effective or ineffective and then use what we have learned from our observation to put together a system that that uh, that unfolds earth care people care and some okay. sort of equitable system that redistributes surplus back into the system and um, helps others to do the same I have no idea how, how much how many chestnuts we get but it's uh, claimed that you get about you know somewhere between 1500 and 2,000 pounds of chestnuts per acre and and these of course are some of the oldest um, just to put a little bit of perspective on that, uh, the average suburban yard in, in the U.S. is about a quarter acre. So imagine joining with three of your neighbors on a, on, in a suburban area, just any town USA, and growing, uh, how much did you say, 2,500 pounds, 1,500 pounds, over 1,000 pounds of, of a particular product. Now that would be putting every single bit of space to that purpose. You don't have to do it that way, of course, but if you take that as, as like your baseline and then add, switch out, you know, a few of those, those nut bearing plants for, you know, fruit or, or other uh, edible things that you're interested in, you can see that you can, you can grow quite a lot of stuff in not that much of an area. And because it's, it's super local, it's like hyper local, you don't have to worry about doing anything with heavy machinery. It all can be hand done. You know, so you're, you're taking out that cost and you're taking out that damage to the, the soil because heavy machinery does compact things and uh, can also disrupt soil biology, which is very important. Virtually every tree has some sort of symbiotic relationship with, with bacteria uh, and, and many other plants do as well. Uh, and also fungi. I think fungi probably even more. But, uh, but anyway... Uh, th that heavy machinery can disrupt that sort of thing, so we're, we're taking that out of the equation by being hyper-local. Hazelnut bushes around here. These are all American selections. Uh, you know, there's probably some European in some of them. So they're a, they're a shrub type. They're resistant to the disease, eastern filbert blight, which is why there isn't a, a large hazelnut industry anywhere other than Oregon and Washington. Cause so, so this is his technique, the, the stun part, the strategic as, as he's putting it now total and utter neglect, that is kind of like a, a trial by fire to see which of his cultivars, especially if you're trying a new cultivar, and a cultivar is just a variation, you've crossed two species, or not, not necessarily two species, but two different plants of, of the same species usually, uh, that you have desirable characteristics from, and you're seeing if you can create something that, that combines both those characteristics. So... The first trial is to see if it can survive on its own. And if it can survive on its own without any inputs from 
fertilizer, from watering, from tilling, from weeding, from uh, herbivore uh, pressures, from fire. Uh, if it can survive on its own, that's a pretty good candidate for having a really hardy stock that is going to need a lot less resources and it will pass that genetic material down to its, its uh, progeny. So then you can take, you can go from there and start crossing it with other of the, of the same species that, that have other characteristics you're looking to combine. Maybe it, it flowers at the right time or, or it, it produces a, a particularly heavy crop. Um, whatever it is you're looking for, you can start crossing in that stuff, but you start with the hardiness factor so that it's very well adapted to its local environment. And you go from there to branch out and, and cross in other genetics that you're interested in. Because they're based on European hazels. When I got started here, I called um, Michigan State University for some information about chestnuts, because Michigan's one of the larger states in the country growing chestnuts. And I said, well, I want to grow chestnuts. Um, you know, where do you live? Wisconsin. And the guy's like, oh, OK. I said, well, um, you know, well, what, what, what should I do? He says, well, first of all, you go find the uh, named varieties, the grafted named varieties that have a proven production record over 20 years or so, and then you plant those named varieties in your orchard, and you plant the rows, you plant the rows 30 feet apart, and you put each tree 30 feet apart, so it'll be about 50 trees per acre. So I'm kind of doing the pencil uh, on, on the back of the envelope and kind of adding this all up. So I got 50 trees. It just didn't seem like enough and when you get on 110 acres that was just like grass and abandoned crop field and you're thinking 50 trees just they just disappear you know and so I got these little trees in the ground and like they seem like a million feet apart uh, so I said okay well what are the named varieties in Wisconsin that have the 20-year proven track record that'll work was well there aren't any <laughs> it's like, well gee thanks for the help my friend you know and then well then what am I supposed to do once you got those proven track record varieties then you take care of this this orchard you do these many fungicide sprays these many herbicide sprays uh, these many pesticide sprays during the year for seven to ten years before you start to generate revenues it's around uh, four to five thousand dollars an acre to set up with only 50 trees and so the reason you have to do all these fungicides especially is because of uh, i think you mentioned it earlier i believe it's the eastern filbert blight that, that I think also affects the, the chestnuts. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, at one point in, in U.S. history, well, basically prehistory, more, more than, than um, after when uh, the Western settlers arrived, but back before colonizers came in, we'll just put it that way, the, the dominant tree in all of the eastern forests, so that's, that's east of the Mississippi as a general rule, especially in like Appalachia and... and um, those states, uh, those modern day states, the dominant tree was the chestnut tree, the American chestnut tree. And it would, it was dominant not only in its numbers, but in its size. They, they called them, the early settlers called them the redwoods of the east because they would get so old, or they, they were so long lived that they would they'd get massive trunks like that of a redwood. And, and they would tower over everything else around them. And there were stories of, of, the crops that would come from those chestnuts being so deep that you could walk across them without ever touching forest floor. It would be two, three inches deep in just chestnuts. So that was the, the, the main staple crop for the indigenous peoples that, that lived in those areas. And uh, yeah, it, it, it dominated all of the eastern forests. And, you know, it, it, it's a nut, so it's high in protein. Uh, it's... it's um, the, the wood itself, I think, was, was good for a lot of different things, uh, for building. Um, and it was, it was like the keystone species, basically. So then, probably, by, probably accidentally, uh, this, this blight gets introduced to the United States, uh, the modern-day United States, uh, or what is present-day United States. And it starts wiping out all of the chestnuts, and I want to say by the middle of the 1800s, some, I'll, I'll, you know, you can look it up yourself, but back before uh, probably any of us who are watching this were born, um, for sure, 
there was almost no chestnuts left. Chestnuts, American chestnuts, I should say, left in the entire country. I think I, I, I want to say that's that's the case. Uh, it just tore through that species like wildfire, to the point where people were cutting down huge blocks uh, of, of trees, like they were proactively trying to get ahead of the blight and, and cut out any tree that they found in, in the path where the blight was spreading across the country. But it wasn't enough. Uh, eventually, almost every single one was destroyed. Now, there's, there's one, uh, uh, what, what would you call it, like a heritage stand, I guess, of, of American chestnuts in Michigan. They, I don't think that was even their native range. They were brought there by people moving uh, westward. Hello, Bread Crochets. How are you tonight? Always good to see you. Uh, so I, I was just talking about the, the chestnuts, the American chestnuts that used to dominate the eastern side of the United States. So anyway, this, this blight came in, and um, there was just a few pockets left across the country. I think there's some very smaller stands out in, in California that have managed to stay blight-free. Um, and it's just, it's been a tragedy. It, it totally changed the, the forest ecosystems, that along with logging, of course, and coal mining and, and other such human activities that, that came along with the industrialized peoples. But uh, it was quite a loss. Uh, it, it, it's hard to even, you know, do it justice how much of a loss that, that American chestnut was. What they're finding now, though, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, what they're finding now with the um, American chestnut is that some of those those trees. Um, so uh, some of those trees. That that had, you know, halfway survived, you know, they, they would send up a shoot every few years and then it would get the blight and then it would die back. And, and this, this would go on decade after decade. But some of those have developed a resistance to the blight finally. After so long of, of being exposed to it, there's been natural resistance developed to that blight. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing how ecosystems tend to, to function this way. It's not just about competition. Uh, it's, it's often not at all about competition. Eventually, a new species that comes in will be absorbed and adapted to by the local flora and fauna. Um, and it doesn't always happen, though. Right? There are certainly things that naturally just go extinct. But sometimes this can happen, where given a long enough time and, a, and enough generations to, um, I guess for better or worse, test their metal against it, they can develop resistance. So there are, there are uh, cultivars now of, of pure American chestnut that, that are able to be sold and uh, grown commercially. It's, it's pretty cool. So there's, there's hope yet. Um, just a, a little aside there. So, uh, with Erking, with Erking, I, I guess that's how you pronounce that one. Uh, either the dice roll well or they die out. Okay. I haven't heard that phrase before. Uh, yeah, this, this is about food in that it's about permaculture. We're, we're talking about permaculture tonight and permaculture often centers around the growing of food in a way that, uh, that is, is following the, the three ethics of earth care, people care, and returning the surplus to the service of the first two, uh, and then also following different permaculture principles, like observe and interact and obtain a yield. And, and Mark Shepard here, this permaculture practitioner, is talking about his way of observing and interacting with the, the cultivars of, of mostly not trees and bushes, but, but uh, the, the different things that he raises and tries to make uh, more hardy to their local environment. So, so that's what we're talking about tonight. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, but I think I'm going to continue on with the video. Then $3,000 a year for, you know, seven to 10 years before you generate revenues. Now, wait a minute. If I start up costs is, is 5,000 an acre plus 3,000 maintenance costs, but if we go five and then three, 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 five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's, so Three thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand dollars per acre before I ever generate revenues. I couldn't afford that. It's just myself, my wife, living in the house that we're building around us with a little baby and another one on the way. We can't do that. Well, then, okay. What about the variety problem? How do we deal with the fact that there are no known varieties that do well here, 
And so once again, I go back to the permaculture thing. Let's observe nature. How does nature uh, produce enough uh, plant material so they can survive, you know, windstorm, fire, tornadoes, grazing, browsing, earthquakes, volcanoes, pests, diseases? Well, it, a, a tree puts out like a zillion seeds. Every seed is a genetically unique individual. Out of those zillion seeds that go into the ground, they're usually really close to one another. There's <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I get your pun there, Wither King. That's very good. Competitive effects between them, the synergistic effects between them and, and other organisms in the soil or whatnot. And the ones that are most suited for the site, the weather conditions, the disturbance regime, for real, no fake. I mean, all the bugs that come at them, these trees have to survive somehow. That's how nature does it. And if nature didn't work, this planet would have been a bare cinder when we got here. So, so this is the, the, the reason, basically, uh, without there having necessarily anything behind it, um, guiding it, but this is how organisms adapt to threats and pressures. They, they have uh, sexual reproduction, which, which you know, as, as you were talking about, tosses the dice a bunch of times. Each of those seeds is a different dice roll. That's a, that's a decent way of thinking about it. Sometimes you, you come up snake eyes and, and you, you, you crap out. Sometimes you, you uh, hit the number you're looking for and that thing survives. So what he's trying to do is work with nature instead of against it and look for those dice rolls that work. Look for those, chant, those, those uh, genetic pieces of genetic material that are proving themselves to, to be more resilient and, and adaptable to their local environment. It works really, really well. So we figured we'd imitate that. So at first what we did is we got a wide diversity of chestnut genetics and did this for all of the different woody species we're working with, pine nuts, hazelnuts, apples included. And you plant a zillion of these different varieties, most of them seedlings, because um, we're told, oh, don't bother to save your fruit seeds because it doesn't bre uh, breed true to type. It's like, excuse me, when was the last time you took an apple seed and put it in the ground and it turned into anything other than an apple? <laughs> That's a little joke that, I mean, you'd have to know a little bit about apple genetics to, to get. With apples and, and others of their, uh, their same family of, of species, like um, I think most pears are, do the same thing. If you take a seed and you put it in the ground, say it's, uh, um, we'll just say a red delicious, uh, one of the worst apple varieties ever created, in my opinion. But a red del delicious, something that's like hard as a brick and is going to uh, <laughs> you know, survive any school lunch you can throw at it. But you take a seed from a red delicious, you plant it in the ground, that tree grows up, and it puts out fruit. None of that fruit will taste like a red delicious. It'll taste like something different. It might be something completely mouth puckering, just so sour and, and, and tart and drying that you can't eat, you just spit it right out. It might be something sickly sweet that, that's so loaded with sugar that uh, um, it, it uh, is undesirable as well. It might be something completely new that, that's, that's better than any variety you found. That, that is the, uh, another roll of the dice. Um, so when he's talking about, you know, I, uh, you know, I believe it always does breed true to type because you always make an apple with an apple seed. Uh, so bread crochets, you say, my kid made me buy a red delicious and she liked it. Well, you know, good on your kid. Uh, <laughs> cause there's probably, probably going to be a lot of, of school bagged lunches in their future, I would imagine. And, you know, they just may have another red delicious. So. When, you know, produce no waste, there's, there's a good one. There's a good permaculture principle for you. When all the kids uh, are, are like, ew, red delicious, they'll be, they'll be uh, you know, raking in that bounty for themselves. Um, so, yeah, but I, I agree with that. Red deliciouses are gross. Um, I definitely prefer a Honeycrisp or um, Opal Apples. I like those as well. They got kind of a, a very mild flavor. There's so many varieties, but, but so... Um, to kind of answer the other part of that, that, you know, lingering question that he hasn't brought up, but it's like, how do you get the same apple again and again? Because eventually the apple trees die. And obviously, you know, there's not just one red delicious apple tree that's supplying the world's red delicious apples. That, that, that would be impossible. Um, so how you get a tree to grow what, what's called true to type, which is you, you, you get a red delicious then by planting it is you have to take a cutting from wood and it's called the scion wood. And usually you look for the new growth in the springtime. 
you cut a bit of it off. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that, the, the flag in the middle in just one second there. Um, so you cut a little bit of the, the, the branch off as it's, uh, you know, sending out um, leaves in the, in the springtime. And then you take root, uh, a little bit of root. You dig up a bit of root from, you know, a tree that, that is going to be the, the root of the new tree. And you just you stick them together. You graft them together. And um, if you do it right... Um, baby bread. <laughs> um, so if you do it right, if, if the, if the graph takes and, and these two fuse together, then you get another red delicious tree that produces red delicious apples, but that's the only way to do it. And it's, it's, it's essentially cloning it. So there's a danger there too, when you're, you're making more of the same type of apple, that if ever there's a disease that affects this particular type of apple, it's going to affect all of the red delicious types of apples. So this can be a genetic bottleneck for a tree in terms of its survivability. So it's good to start new varieties and experiment around. Um, so anyway, uh, so, oh, baby bread. Uh, so the, the 4D triangle, I haven't heard it described as a 4D triangle. So what you're referring to is, let me, let me point in the right direction. So right in the middle there, uh, that way, right in the center of my screen there. Let me see if I can get my cursor over it a little bit more. So this one here. This flag here is, is my own flag for my channel. So in the background, of course, is the anarcho-communist flag, because that's that that tends to be the, the political ideology that I follow. In the middle is my own symbol for Solaris, and that's what I'm trying to do here, is, is synthesize uh, leftist political thoughts and, and philosophies with permaculture and new urbanism. So you have the three points of the triangle there. Um, and you'll notice in the border there, you have three points represented again. So um, in the upper left-hand corner, you you have, there's actually no symbol for new urbanism, but uh, that, that's about as close as I could get to an approximation of it. You have uh, some buildings, you have mass transit, a bicyclist, and a tree. So I thought that was a pretty good symbol for new urbanism. Over in the right-hand corner uh, of my screen, so I'm going to have to point in the opposite direction. Yeah, so up that way, up in that very far right-hand corner, there's permaculture. That's that's the 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 symbol that is on the front of permaculture a designer's manual, which is one of the most important texts in permaculture. And so then down, uh, oh sorry, that way, straight across in the middle there, that's a symbol I found for left unity. So it represents the black of anarchy, the red of communism, and then the green of of eco, uh, you know, ecological concerns. And then in the middle, you have this, you have this, this uh, knot that ties everything together. So it's, it's supposed to represent left unity. I found that too. So going back up to my flag uh, up there in the center there, that, that red um, and black background with the yellow and the, the green triangles, Solaris is, is represented as that triangle to have the three points of those three um, different philosophies blending together. Then you have the green of ecology and, and the natural world. That's the green triangles. And behind it, you have the sun, which is at the heart of everything. It, the, the sun to me, which is why I called it Solaris, which means of the sun. So the sun to me represents uh, the, the interconnectedness of everything. Literally all the matter on earth, the things that you are made out of, uh, the physical matter, uh, the, the energy that you rely on, uh, either directly or indirectly, all comes from the sun and other stars, literally. Um, so I felt that was a good then metaphor to use for these three philosophies, which I think at the heart of each of them have interconnectedness and interdependence uh, at their core. So going back to the triangles there, we have the downward pointed triangle, which represents a lot of things. It represents solidarity with a lot of the oppressed people from the past. You have um, the the socialists, and the Jews in the concentration camps during World War II, who had to wear a downward facing triangle. Uh, you have the symbol for feminism, for LGBTQIA equality uh, of rights, uh, all these different things that, that I'm trying to show solidarity with. Um, oh, cool. And then you have the, the, so the triangles, why they're a fractal then too, it's a simple fractal of triangles, so you have nine triangles, including the, the small yellow ones, um, which 
as a whole represent more than the sum of their parts. So with those nine triangles, you can make 13 triangles total. So the nine small ones plus um, uh, four more triangles, including the large triangle all the way around. So it's the, the sum of all the parts being more, or the whole being more than just the sum of its parts. Um, so you have that symbology as well. So there you have it. So it's, it's something I made up myself. That's why it's the symbol for my channel. And uh, yeah, everything I, I put my uh, name on for my work. I like your, your symbols as well, bread crochets. Those are all really cool. So anyway, that, that's an explanation of my, my symbols. And uh, um, I think the rest of them around you know, the border should be somewhat self-explanatory. But just in case they're not, let's, let's just go through them real quick, because this is a pretty new border that I just made in the last couple streams. So starting with the top right corner, we have again the, um, the new urbanist symbol, or just my, my stand-in for a new urbanism symbol. New urbanism is about building community and better functioning cities that are you know, less polluting and more for the upliftment of the people that live there. To the right of that is a symbol for uh, solar punk which I think is a pretty cool movement. It is kind of the answer to cyberpunk. So instead of a dystopian yet flashy future where capitalism has basically taken over everything, uh, like you'd see in, in that cyberpunk game that came out recently, you have solarpunk where people have come together to collectively do things to heal the land and bring themselves closer to um, the ecology that they work with. Oh, I like those symbols. Oh, I see the left flank vets one there. That's a really cool one. I'm not familiar with the two next to that, though, Wither King, but those are cool symbols as well. Um, so there's solar punk there. And, and then you have the, the um, eco-anarchy flag behind it. Not to be confused with anarcho-primitivism. That's not something that, that I really uh, play around with. I, I, I think they have a lot of uh, misguided ideas about the roles of, of people. And, and whatnot. And, and they're just uh, a bit too Luddite for my taste as well. I think it's okay to use modern technology. We just need to use it in a, in a more smart and uh, uplifting way that, that helps everyone, not just the, the owners of the world. But anyway, there's, there's uh, um, solar punk. So right next to my flag is a flag that I just happened to find uh, that's supposed to represent indigenous unity across the planet. So you have the, the four different colors that you'd see from, that's a, that's a common theme in uh, Lakota symbology, I know. I, and then you have the feather representing um, indigenous cultures. Uh, and I, I don't know as much about that flag. I'm, I'm fairly new to it, but I thought it'd be an important thing to, to make sure that they at least got some representation on my, my border there. So then you have my flag that I just explained. And then you have uh, Black Lives Matter with the, the power fist that has been... Uh, the universal symbol for uh, rising up from below and, and taking the power that is due you uh, from away from the people that seek to hoard it and hold you down. Next to that is just a little symbol that I found for aquaponics because I like aquaponics a lot. I think it's a really cool system that doesn't get a lot of play even within permaculture spaces. Uh, but basically it's taking hydroponics, which is the growing of food in an aqueous solution for nutrients, and um, aquaculture, which is raising a fish, combining them in a system where the plants filter the water for the fish so you don't have the problem of, of fish poop just overwhelming the system and killing the fish. And at the same time, you have nutrients that are more or less free to the plants themselves. So you circulate the, the water through the beds of the plants. They, they usually grow in some sort of a medium that's not soil uh, per se, but maybe chipped rock or compacted clay pellets or something like that. And so they just reach their roots down into there and they suck up all the nutrients they like. Uh, and also is a way to water things very efficiently. Um, so then again, next to that is the permaculture symbol. So going down the right side of the flag there, those are the three permaculture ethics, uh, care for the earth, care for people, and return of surplus or fair share as it's represented here. Of course, there's the anti-fascist flag, uh, one of the versions of it. You also see the, the red on top of black. It just depends on, on which one, which side of anarchy or communism you, you favor. Um, and then there's me. I, I'm, I'm uh, down there in the corner on the right-hand side, lower right. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, uh, Wither King. Aquaponics is pretty cool. I like it a lot. Uh, yes, and the blue and black is anarcho-transhumanism. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that in one second. So, so just going uh, 
I got to always point in the opposite direction. So going in this direction from the bottom here, we have eco anarchy. So that's anarchism that that tries to include more kingdoms and realms of life than just humanity in its anarchist uh, praxis. Um, and I think it's incredibly vital for that component to be added into any left theory. We can't ignore the earth and hope to continue on, no matter how good our, our new system of government may be that we, we win for ourselves. And then again, the, the leftist unity symbol. Um, I just thought that was pretty cool. I don't know how widely used that is. I, I found it on some forum somewhere. And then, yes, the, the anarcho-transhumanism, uh, because I'm not opposed to appropriate uses of technology, and I think that modern technology has done a lot of wonderful things, especially in the realms of, of medicine and uh, communications. Hey, we wouldn't be able to talk to each other without modern... Uh, we wouldn't be talking to each other right now, that is, without modern communication technology. Next to that, the, the purple and black is the anarcha feminista flag. I believe feminism is important. Women are, are people. <laughs> yeah, I know that's a, a radical thing sometimes and deserve to live their lives as they see fit, just as uh, men and uh, anyone does. And that should also include non-binary people as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the all are welcome here. Uh, that's a, a symbol that was created by someone uh, from my area. Uh, someone in Minnesota created that first as a response to the, the hate and vitriol that was coming out of the, the Trump campaign. Um, and on top of that is the asexual flag. Um, I'm not, I'm not real versed on, on what each of those bars mean, but it, it has to do with people that are completely not attracted to, not, uh, physically or romantically or sexually attracted to other people. And then, and various flavors of, of, and combinations of how that can play out. Some non, um, some ace people are attracted to people romantically, but not physically or sexually or vice versa. Um, there's, there's many ways that that can uh, manifest itself. On top of that is the non-binary flag, uh, and that represents people that, that either represent uh, or you know, have a number of different genders that they identify with or varying genders at different times uh, or just don't subscribe to any sort of the prescribed gender uh, binary. Uh, and then on top of that is, is a more modern... Uh, version of the rainbow flag for uh, LGBTQIA uh, pride. And you have the, the black and the brown representing the need to center people of, of color in that movement as well because they have gotten short shrift over the course of, of uh, the movement. And then the uh, trans symbols uh, inside of uh, that, that triangle there too. Because trans people often get erasure from uh, the more established wings of um, the LGBT community. So it's important to put them back uh, front and center. And there you have it, all the, all the symbols in my, uh, in my uh, what do you call it, frame that I've, I've created for the channel. And these may change out, you know, I'm, I, I had a whole bunch of them that had to be left on the, the cutting room floor, so I may... Uh, animated at some point so they switch in and out um, the, uh, some stuff that got left behind um, but for now that, that's what I got ah, so thanks for hanging with me through that, that long explanation but there you have it that's what all that stuff says okay uh, so proudly radicals so wither king says proudly radicals cappy the capybara uh, and a black guy which is acting as a sit-in for me. Oh, okay. That's what the the, uh, the other ones are. Cappy the Capybara. That's funny. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I th I'm, I'm sure that's in reference to the, the pack of capybaras that have taken over a uh, high-end luxury gated community. I can't remember the South American country it was. It was Argentina, something like that. That's really cool, though. Um <laughs> Anyway, I think that's enough of an aside for now. So let's get back into Mark Shepard and his philosophy, the reason that he does the, the breeding the way that he does. Mm. Our seeds breed true to type. They don't look exactly like their parents. That's the whole point of sexual reproduction. You don't look like your parents. Your brothers and sisters don't look like you. That's the whole point. We want the genetic variations that show up and survive right here with stun, strategic total utter neglect. 
So what you'll see in here, there's a lot of trees that are dying. Um, and the reason why is because uh, we have some trees that are American chestnut, which is susceptible to chestnut blight. We have uh, Chinese chestnut that isn't cold hardy enough for Wisconsin. So how do, how do you start growing chestnuts when the two varieties that you could use won't survive in Wisconsin? Well, we have a lot of European chestnuts that also are not cold hardy enough here. And then I got a whole bunch of different hybrids which are already crosses between Chinese and, and American and European and American, that sort of thing. Well, we breed them mm -hmm. and you just put them in the ground and the ones that die don't get to reproduce. You know, if you look at just like, the one, by like the that one right there. This <laughs> one right now is not contributing to the gene pool. Oh, I apologize for that. I just assumed that that was where the capybara came from. So the capybara has been a symbol for their, their stream since before they moved to, to Twitch. Oh, that's cool. Um, capybara is a cool critter. Uh, they seem to be one of the most friendly animals in the wild still that, that I guess haven't been totally domesticated. So, uh, yeah, cool. Anyway, love some capybaras. <laughs> and that's perfect. And so when all of a sudden the disease comes The leftist of nature, I like that. Through, do I get all freaked out and, oh, I gotta prevent the disease. It's like, no, that's reality. I'm not gonna prevent reality. So let's take an apple orchard, for example. 100% of all of the problems in an orchard uh, are because we're, we're trying to create reality through our idea of orchard. And orchard is purely a human construct. This is some idea that somebody came up with once upon a time. So what we do is we take this plant, an apple tree or a pear tree, whatever, out of its natural context of living with the real world, put it in a block all by itself. Now we've concentrated apple in one place. What does it do? It attracts all the pests and diseases that attack apples. And so when a pest comes in, so, oh no, we have a problem. Well, the problem was caused by the fact that you had this idea of orchard and, it, and it's not real. It's false idea. That's not how nature works. So what we do here is we let things go as wild and natural as possible. And when a, a pest or a disease comes in, you let it run its course with uh, pests, for example. In order to get good pest control, the pest has to come in. So let's, let's say it's a chestnut pest. They come in and eat the chestnuts. Uh, the population booms because there's no control mechanism in place. You need enough pests in order to feed the predators of the pests. So if I sprayed to get rid of the pests, I'd never have enough uh, pests to feed predators um, and, and then so on up the food chain. So what'll happen in the early years, you'll have an amazing amount of pest pressure and then it drops down. Does it go away? No, it's always here. We always have the pests, all the apple pests in the world we have, but you get a lower level than you would have in the, than in the early years. So this is one of the, the permaculture ideas of, of recreating as, as closely as possible a naturally functioning ecosystem that, that also happens to produce a lot of things for, for human use. Uh, the idea being that, like he says, you never get rid of all the pests. You're still going to have some, uh, maybe even some entire crops that, that fail in a given year. But for one thing, you, you do a lot of different things all at once. So you're hedging your bets against that sort of thing. So any one particular crop fails, that doesn't mean that all of them fail. Wither King, thank you so much for the follow. Uh, so, so you're hedging your bets by, by diversity. So use and value diversity. That's one of the permaculture principles. But then also, uh, because you're allowing these, these, these uh, pests, uh, not only the pests to come in, but their predators, eventually things get to what's known as a dynamic equilibrium, where, you know, some years you'll have a lot of certain pests, but then that creates a lot, as you said, that creates a lot more food for the predators that prey on them. So then the next year they'll go down. And it'll go up and down. You'll never get the, the high highs that you would have in, say, a monoculture. So without doing any sort of spraying on, say, a cornfield, all it takes is one pest of corn, and they just go crazy. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. And and they'll just there's nothing slowing them down or stopping them. And it's hard then for their it may be hard for their predators to keep up with it even because there's not necessarily habitat for both. The, the prey and the predator. So it, it's really good for the pest as, as long as it lasts, but it's, it's not so as great for the predator. So things don't reach that dynamic equilibrium nearly as much. Um, and that's, that's another advantage of having the diversity is you don't have that all-you-can-eat buffet just laid out there acre after acre after acre. Like imagine your favorite food and it just happened to show up and grow on, on trees uh, 
as far as the eye can see. You could just keep eating and eating and eating. Uh, and um, if you were a, a, then a bug, reproducing very, very quickly, and then they would start eating and, and there would just be nothing to slow you down. Now, instead, imagine a field that had some of your favorite food, but then a lot of stuff that you didn't even realize was food. You don't recognize it as food. It's going to slow you down a whole lot. You may balloon in population in one small spot, but it's going to be a lot harder for you to, you know, go from spot to spot because there's all that, that, that space in between that's food that you just don't care about, right? Yeah, tailoring ecosystems instead of strangling. Uh, I like to think of it as being co-creators in an ecosystem rather than just viewing that ecosystem as uh, just another product to be, you have a bunch of inputs and then you take a lot of outputs and it's a very industrial way of, of looking at things. I was, when I first heard agriculture as described as industrial, I thought it was really bizarre because it's not like a factory. You don't have a bunch of people that go into a, a cornfield and just, you know, sit at machines producing corn that, you know, it's, it's part of nature. So I always thought it was very strange uh, that it was classified as industry, but the way that, that capitalists view it is, is definitely just as another industry. You have inputs in, in money and materials and you have outputs in, in materials and profit and that it doesn't go any farther than that. So this is much more comprehensive and inclusive and, as a result, much more resilient and sustainable in the long term. Uh, same with the disease. Now with chestnuts, it's really fascinating is um, with chestnut blight in American, it's, it's shown that it's, it's the genetic resistance within the plant. Same with Eastern filbert blight and hazelnuts, is it's something genetic within the plant that allows it to survive against that disease. So my idea in the early years was with the Chinese genetics, let's get some Chinese genetics in here to be disease resistant to chestnut blight, some American genetics in here to be cold hardy, and you cross the two and then we'll have these chestnut trees that are adapted and survivable. Now how can I ever know that my plants are resistant to a disease unless I have enough disease around? So I wanna make sure that there's enough disease around to properly infect my, my other trees. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of dead trees and they, they kind of thin themselves. They just get the disease and they die back and then they don't contribute their susceptibility genes back to the gene pool. We keep saving our seed uh, and keep rolling forward. And we've got some really productive trees. We got some duds and when you got a dud, you cut them down, you put them, you know, put them in the wood stove, keep you warm in the winter time, <laughs> or you, uh, you know, inoculate them with mushroom spawn and, and grow mushrooms. You never have to come in here and mow this. I, I do just before harvest. Okay. You're, you're talking about just where we're walking? Yeah. Or do you mow around the trees too? No, no, no. So they're telling me to put 50 trees per acre, so I did that. Okay, so now I've got my 50 trees per acre. The, the second year I had two of those trees, because a lot of them were seedlings, because there are no grafted varieties that will survive around here. Two of those trees flowered the second year, and they were like 800 feet apart. And it's like chestnuts are mostly wind pollinated. They'll never pollinate mm. 800 feet apart. I had to put trees closer together in the row. So the first year I was at like 30 feet apart. Then the second year is 30 feet apart. And that was when I discovered the first one's blooming. And the third year I went and I filled in the spaces halfway. So now everything's 15 feet <laughs> apart. Then I started up on the ridge, putting them in six feet apart. And then I started back up from the bottom of the ridge going like three feet apart. And then by the time I shifted to the, to the north ridge, we're going double rows, three feet apart um, with a stem density of around 4,000 stems per acre. How could I do that? because you look at the cost of these plants. It's costing me, if I'm buying wholesale, I gotta buy a thousand plants at a time, I can get them for five bucks a pop. That's like a fortune. Well, if I was saving my seed for my early ones, and if you take, if you take <clears throat> these trees that produced in one year, right, put those seeds in the ground, you've all automatically concentrated the seeds that reproduce really fast, the trees that reproduce really fast. Then you keep planting those in a block together and you keep saving the seed. So that means in year two, you've got trees. Year three, you've got trees. Well then year four, maybe one of these 50 to 100 trees that you have is producing five nuts per tree. Uh, now you're concentrating the ones that produce a uh, heavier yield because there's more seeds in the gene pool. So as you go along the line, you're concentrating fast reproduction, um, heavy yield, pest and disease resistance, and how you know for pest and disease resistance because you're not spraying anything, you're just letting it turn loose and go, go wild. 
what is happening and does happen is you lose traits here and there. Well, that's why we keep bringing in prize bulls every once in a while of the grafted select cultivars, put them out there and let them pollinate. Real live, real live, and listen, listen to the birds. I hope the birds woke you up this morning. Yeah, they're beautiful. You got a lot of wildlife here. Some grapes, and these are elderberries. So, I mowed this row of elderberries last year just to kind of start them over again. So a tree, let's say a tree dies. Yep. You need to replace it. You've had your nursery man grow it up. How then do you just do you, do you just move some grass out of the way and put it down, or what do you do? Move grass out of the way. What do you mean? What do you do to take that tree from the nursery? Oh, you just take a shovel, shovel me around, <laughs> step on it. Um, with, right in among it. Yeah. Well, there's there's uh, there's there's raspberries and elderberries, and here's here's a, a replacement chestnut. You know, right here. You just shove awesome. it in there. When there's a okay. hole, you just okay. shove it in with a shovel. Now, what is interesting? Now, now listen to all the diversity that he's talking about. Uh, reject modernity, embrace nature. I think we can do both. We, I mean, the, the permaculture is, is fairly modern ideas, only around since the 70s, although the, the ideas that they uh, crafted to create permaculture did come from a lot of indigenous communities, so those ideas do go way back. Um, but we can do modern ideas and just apply them to a way that's more ecologically friendly. I think there's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but listen to the diversity that he's talking about. Now, he's, he's this, this so-called orchard is for uh, these chestnut trees, ostensibly. But listen to all the different varieties of other stuff he's got growing, each of them having an edible yield of stuff. Elderberries, raspberries, uh, I think he mentioned a, a couple different more things, and there's probably a whole lot more in there. Uh, so just without having to do a whole lot, he's created a whole lot of diversity for himself and a whole lot more food than supposedly can grow in this space just doing uh, chestnuts. 50 per acre. That's, that's not that many trees, really, no matter what you're, you're looking at. Um, and uh, even if they were to be like the, the large overstory trees eventually, you can always put more trees in between them too. So, and, that, and that's one of the other secrets to th this sort of permaculture design is that we're, we're stacking in, in, in space and in time uh, all these different elements. So if the density for this, this very large tree, like the most you could really pack it in, was 50 per acre, then in between all those spaces, you could uh, uh, have other trees that are smaller, that don't need as much space in between them, that can thrive in the understory of those trees. Um, so very quickly, you get a whole lot more yields than, than just that one tree. Even, even packed at its maximum density, you know, say you have mulberries as well, like he was talking about mulberries. So you have a yield of mulberries every year, and then you could have a yield of cherries, and then you could have smaller stuff like bushes, like small hazelnut bushes that you get another yield from. And you just stack all of these in the same space instead of doing the, the prescribed method of, of having everything spaced out and only doing one thing. By bringing in that diversity, you have a lot more niches that you can fill. So... So that's what that's what permaculture seeks to do, and if done right, a mature permaculture system can outperform any monocrop on Earth, hands down, no problem, without machinery necessarily, although there is sometimes machinery used, um, but uh, without all the inputs needed of modern industrialized agriculture. So uh, uh, there's one more question from Tivas01. What do you think of Marx and Marxist? Well, I've done a number of, of uh, Marxist literatures. Marx, I've done a number of Marxist literatures. Yeah, that sounds real intelligent. Um, I have covered a number of, of Marxist literature books on this stream. So every Friday night, I do a theory stream. You can, you can look uh, back in my, my VOD catalog uh, here on Twitch, or you can go to my YouTube. Just uh, every once in a while, that, that uh, comes around. The, the night bot will be chatting that out pretty soon. So you can, you can find my uh youtube archive and you can see exactly what i think about uh, marx and marxist ideas I, I i tend to like them i like all leftist ideas for the most part uh, as long as they're not trying to leave out one minority group or another i think there's a lot to be gained from virtually every corner of leftism i myself you know you can probably tell by my my flags up here skew more towards the anarchy side uh 
for a number of different reasons, but I, I don't really find anything wrong with, with Marx and his approach. And definitely ideas uh, like the idea that material conditions are, are the biggest driver of uh, how things play out in humanity. I think that that's, that's very critical for any leftist to be considering and that things are going to be different with different material conditions. You're going to have different outcomes uh, depending on what the conditions on the ground are. And that's very important. The idea of the, the labor theory of value, I think, is, is quite critical. Uh, and it's it's just it it is self evident if you look at any sort of uh, organization, any sort of business, whether that's a service or a product oriented company. If you were to take out the workers, uh, unless it's a very small operation, that business is going to fail. That right there shows where that the the uh, value is generated. The the profit from that business is generated from the efforts of the workers, because without them, it would fail. And the opposite is, is more often than not untrue. So without the, the owner at the top, there's going to be plenty of people, especially if it's an established business, there's going to be plenty of people that can fill the, whatever work the owner did uh, and, and keep things running just fine without them. So we, we don't need to have special ownership classes. Uh, we can get by just fine, all of us in a particular enterprise being owners, and beneficiaries of the product and the fruit of our labor. So I hope that clears things up a, a little bit there. TVs, TVs, one, TVs one, probably that's what I guess for your name there. Um, who was it who said, is it Toby Hemingway? I think uh, is, is who, who wrote that at a certain point in time, all of a sudden your system will pop and it'll, things okay. will just go better. And it was probably like five or six years in that, uh, you know, at first trees would just die left and right and left and right. It just wasn't happening. And then all of a sudden at some point in time, you, know, you could just stick a tree in the ground and it'd grow great. And um, I think a lot of that has to do with mm. succession. Our site, site has gone through succession over time, more organic matter, more soil life. There's no more toxic sprays. Uh, and a lot of this, the trees, their roots have associations you know, with all kinds of, you know, soil life underground, not just mycorrhizal fungi. So that now I, I kind of jokingly say that, yeah, if I ever drop a tree, you know, on my way out somewhere, it just hits the ground and it starts growing. Um, <laughs> no mulch. I don't mulch. No I tried it. And, and, and that is really the goal of the principle of small and slow solutions. Uh, you start out with a, a lot of very small things, a lot of small changes to the landscape. And over time, as, as you help knit together a, a real and functioning ecosystem that you are a, a player in and a big part of, the work starts doing itself. You have uh, predators keeping pests in, con in, in relative control. You have plants shading one another, uh, keeping that soil from drying out. You have all these sorts of synergies that, that start to happen so that by the end state, there's not a lot of maintenance you need to do. And that's that's really the big promise of permaculture because it's the opposite of the way that, that industrial agriculture goes. Industrial agriculture, you start by just clearing everything, just clean slate. And then uh, you put in the thing that you want. And uh, as you manage that system over time, because you're only uh, taking out to begin with, eventually it starts depleting. The system starts breaking down, and you need to start adding more stuff to it. More fertilizer, more water, uh, more uh, weeding is, is necessary as the system goes on. And that just continues on. You can rotate crops to, to mitigate a little bit of that damage, but eventually, you know, even still, even after the, you know, even after almost 100 years past the, the Dust Bowl era, we are still losing topsoil at a rate of like, uh, oh, what is it, like a tenth of an inch every year on average across the, the country of the U.S., I should say. Just because that land is, is being managed in a way that it continually degrades. And so you have to have more and more inputs as time goes on to get back what you've allowed to slip away through industrial practices, basically. So permaculture turns that on its head. You start small, and you do a lot of work up front, 
relative to at the end state where you do a lot less work. You're just tending and tweaking here and there. And things just kind of go along as they normally would. And you just happen to be a beneficiary uh, and, and a real part of that ecosystem. Uh, but let's continue on with, with the video here. At first, what, what I'll do at the most, you saw that little nursery row up yeah. there. That's at, at, at the most, they'll get mowed on either side. Mowed on either side, but never in the middle. No, why bother? Okay, cool. You know, there's this myth Good. that grass kills trees. Tell that to the trees of the world. Tell that to the savannas of the world. Uh, yes, there's competition between the grass and the trees for nutrients and moisture. So what? You know, as long as a tree, and if the tree dies because it can't handle the competition, guess what? I'm not interested because it can't <laughs> handle the competition. Am I getting the yields that a, that a, a real on their game orchardist and, a, and um, uh, I'm gonna butcher his last name, uh, Michael Phillips and Stefan Sokoviak. Sokoviak. I'm butchering it too. <laughs> Sorry, Stefan. <laughs> Those guys are masters at their craft. They are like some of the best fruit growers that I know of. They are so in tune with pest and disease cycles and all that kind of stuff. Probably either one of them would come here and throw up because this would make them <laughs> sick what's going on. But that's not the point. My yields are probably only 10% of their yields, but my costs are a hundredth of theirs. And so if and keep in mind, his, his system is not yet at maturity. Those trees are all going to get bigger, and eventually he will come across those super hardy uh, specimens that he will then propagate and, and fill things in even more. So even though he's at 10% of these, these you know, world-class forest managers or orchard managers, uh, yeah, like he says, a lot less input, and eventually there'll be a lot more reward. If you do the math on that, my margin is a lot higher. The amount of work that I have to do goes way down. This is typically the time of year anyways um, that I go to the boundary waters and I disappear off into the woods for a couple of weeks or so because it's the hotter part of the summer. You know, the animals are doing fine and then the trees are doing fine. They're just ripening their crops. I'm out of here. Why work, right? So this vehicle lane is actually uh, the old State Highway 56. It's a state right-of-way. used to be where the road was, so it's now you know, half a mile north of us here. This area was settled in the 1830s by Europeans. It was already settled here for who knows how many thousands of years prior to that. This place was covered with ash trees. It was a thicket of ash trees. Well, when the Europeans first got here, they had to clear out all this brush and so then they constructed a road to get down to, you know, the nearest uh, village, Viola, which is, you know, almost 10 miles away. And so what this is, if this is the road going to town, this is the brush on the side of the road. So since 1830s, they've been cutting it with axes, pulling the stumps out with mules and horses, <laughs> burning it, uh, grubbing out the, the roots with Norwegian bachelor farmers. Uh, and then later on, as things progress, everything <clears throat> on either side was seen then corn and oats and wheat and stuff like that. And then dairy cows and grazing. Well, then as, as technology progress, then they come by with the mower, the brush hog, and they start brush hogging on the side of the road. Well, then technology advanced even further, and they have what's called a wet blade, and you put a little herbicide in the tub, and it applies herbicide as you chip the crap on the side of the road. <laughs> Human beings have been fighting against nature here for over 150 years, and they've lost every single time. <laughs> so this is an there ecological is. model. This is an ecological model of sustainable agriculture. And what we have is we have two different species of hickory. We have cherries, we have grapes, we have mulberries, we have wild plum, we have butternut, we have hazelnut, uh, we have elderberry, we have uh, wild rose. We, there's 10 different edible food crops right there. There's 10 different food crops that we can grow in the same place with 150 years of trying to kill it. So if you're planting, think about this, if you're planting food plants and you're trying to keep them alive, you're doing the wrong thing. We wanna have systems that are so resilient that we can try to kill them and we can't get rid of the dang things. <laughs> and so 10 different woody species up above, well now what if we're grazing cows, pigs, sheep, uh, yeah, I was gonna say cattle, but those would be cows. Um, <laughs> goats would like to do a lot more browsing than the, than the cattle and the, and the sheep would. 
Uh, in under under the ground in here in the spring, you can find morel mushrooms. There's there's uh, wild asparagus growing in here. There's gooseberries growing in under the shade. I'm already up to 16 different food plants in a system that they can't kill. You get that? Yeah. That's sustainable. That's, that's just incredible. That's incredible. That that's the sort of thing that that permaculture is shooting for. Look at look at all the diversity that just is doing fine on its own uh, in this basically a hedgerow, uh, very diverse hedgerow, and, and think of all the things that he can pull out of that at any given time, and uh, really not even have to worry about. If, if he can't get to it all, like the worst that can happen is it just puts out food the next year, um, and perhaps more some stuff grows up and it gets even thicker and, and fuller of, of stuff. But that, yeah. That's that's cool. That that represents the the sort of diversity that that we're looking for with these permaculture systems. And and diversity can happen even in a city too. I, I like to remind everyone that look, I'm I'm oh sorry, always the wrong, the wrong side. I have to get used to that backwards. Um, and you can see just that that hibiscus again over my shoulder. I got a hibiscus tree in this room and and a few other plants. But in my my main living room, I have a hundred different species, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating that at all a hundred different species of plants most most of them not necessarily edible uh, or or useful for uh, much of anything but beauty but beauty is an important part uh, but some of them are edible like the the passion vine that i have that's taken over a big portion of my living room and the pepper plant i have growing in my my window box uh, just outside my kitchen window uh, and i don't have a balcony i'm on the the third floor i i this is it. We have a, a sunny window and uh, a, a little um, flower box, and that's the that's the extent of our uh, of what we have to to grow things, and then and just growing space in the living room that we've set aside. But you can have that kind of diversity anywhere. Uh, it just has to be intentional, and you have to do what he does. You observe and interact, and you you see what works, and go with the things that that you find work best agriculture so I'm not saying that we're going to design our farms to look like this but these are the these are the principles that nature operates by that we need to observe understand and then imitate and then we can make it easy to plant easy to maintain easy to harvest that sort of thing but there you go that's that is that's 150 your... years of stun -ah. That's it. That's it. Sheer That's total it. utter it. neglect and abuse. You, <laughs> yeah. It's been abused for 150 years. Stunna, huh? <laughs> Stunna. And this is it. This is the original, or That's, you've planted something I've, there? Nothing. I've done nothing. Nothing. To this. Oh, there's raspberries. And there's you'll come and 17. harvest out there. Yeah, whatever's in there. Sure, you bet. <laughs> <laughs>
um, and that's vitriology, I believe, is the, the study of it. So I'm sure there's some technical term for the study of orchards and their management, but um, maybe silviculture, maybe it falls into silviculture, which is the cultivation of trees. I don't know. Maybe that's just for, <laughs> maybe that's just for um, hardwoods and stuff like that. Maybe it's not for food trees. Hello to you. Good evening as well, Ali Osher. Oh, oh yeah, and I forgot to shout people out tonight, so we'll start with you, Ali. Ali Osher is a really cool leftist streamer. He, he talks about all kinds of um, political issues, does good coverage of... Um, Oh, and, and good night to you, Wither King. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the stream. I hope to see you in future streams this upcoming Wednesday. I usually do Fridays, but this upcoming Wednesday, I'm going to be continuing on, continuing on uh, doing the audiobook of Lenin's State and Revolution. So I hope to, to have you there to, to check that out as well. I'm going to have a, a guest on from For We Are Many, a uh, cool group of, of leftists. And uh, yeah, we're going to discuss it and, and get into chapter two of, of the text. Um, but yeah, so uh, let me just shout you out there, Ali Osher. And then also bread crochets. Um, I, I forgot to shout you out earlier, so I will shout you out as well. Two great leftist streamers to, to check out. Um, Ali, Ali covers a lot of uh, current event stuff. Um, does a lot of live streaming of, of like, um, Whenever Biden or, or Jen Psaki goes on, uh, you're quite welcome for the shout out. Thank you for what you do, Allie. Um, and then Brett Crochets likes to do crochets and then uh, listen to theory audiobooks or text to speech versions of audiobooks. Same, same sort of thing. Um, so, another great streamer to check out, especially if you're interested in theory, is uh, Brett Crochets. There you are. Uh, but let's continue on in the video now. I mean, isn't that, isn't that just aesthetically pleasing? Isn't that a beautiful way to arrange a food growing operation it almost looks like a you know a thumbprint or something like that when you when you scale back to that level there, there's a lot to be said my, my guest last week uh mike hogue he, he has a, a book coming out uh, which talks about the importance of beauty in the the permaculture design work that we do and i think he's he's really on to something i think beauty is that thing that's going to connect a lot of people to this movement and to uh, even leftism in general I think it, it can't be understated how much, uh, and not we're not just talking surface level aesthetics, but but creating true and lasting beauty, and and however that 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 uh, manifests for you, uh, I think that's that's one of the most powerful ways to bridge that that is ought gap. So, like science and philosophy can describe the world as it is, uh, and they can tell us what to do if we want a certain outcome or another. What's the what's the best course to get that likely outcome? But they can't tell us why we ought to do something. That has to come in. That that makes the leap to the emotional side. You have to have some sort of emotional emotional connection to want to make uh, a more egalitarian world. You may not care about other people. You may be like, oh, I just got mind jack. So so no amount of facts and 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 uh, irrefutable data is ever going to change that sort of thing. But perhaps beauty might bridge that gap, at least for some people, because uh, it hits you in a different way than than just facts and and logic and data do. At the same time, we, of course, have to be rigorous in the way that we go about things. We can't just make things that, that look pretty but fall apart at the, you know, slightest of breezes. But I think at the same time, beauty can't be ruled out as a vital and uh, necessary component of, of anything that we do. We have to make things look attractive to, to get people there. Um, so I think Mark Shepard really is on a, a, a good path towards that. Mark, if people want more of you, 
Are you gonna stop? <laughs> people want if, more of me. If people want more of you. I'll have to gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to gain weight. Where do they go? Well, uh, and what can you offer them? Well, Restoration Agriculture Development. We're we're a consulting and design and installation firm. We do everything uh, from farm and homestead design to earthworks installation. Uh, we do a lot of aquatics, uh, aquaculture systems. Uh, then the tree and shrub nursery where we're selling our cold hardy pest and disease resistant seedlings. We also, we're a networked nursery, whereas we have other collaborators that are doing similar things in different regions. And so uh, no matter what the edible woody crop species is, we have on the ground selection in that region so if you're for example from Georgia and you order pecans from us we're gonna give you the Georgia cultivars not the you know the northern Iowa uh, cultivars though they will have been bred and selected near you somewhere that's forestag.com but an ongoing um, educational uh, information that's online much of it is free we're called the Ecolonomics Action Team that's a contraction of the word ecological and economics we do between 12 and 16 uh, live webinars every single week that you know, be a member of the Eat Free community. And I think it's ecolonomics.org uh, to go join there. And there's different levels, there's more information available to you. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of hours worth of archived uh, webinars on how to live this way. Everything from finance to aquaculture to controlled environments, greenhouses, um, you know, chestnuts, hazels. I've done a forest ecology curriculum, a graduate level forest ecology curriculum that, that you can participate in uh, online, so go check that out. All of our instructors are doing what they teach. We don't have people who've just like researched it and are repeating information that they've heard. Uh, we're not just like an empty blog site where we're sending out these really cute posts. We're people who are living this way and teaching others how we do it. Cool. I'll leave the link to that stuff in the description. Cool. Mark has passed me off. I've gotten the kids. Mark's wife, Jen. Yes. And we're foraging for berries. Yeah. Near the house. Lily, you want what are to these? Try? These are Nanking cherries. Oh, you're trying to do The bush cherries. You'll try them, Jonah. She was telling us earlier. Yes, the guineas do actually keep the ticks down the way she knows. She would be picking ticks off cats. And then once she got the guineas, significantly less ticks. And that would be guinea fowl, um, not, not people from uh, Guinea or Papua New Guinea. Uh, Guinea fowl is, is a lesser known uh, bird that can be used for, for meat in the, in the way that a, a pheasant or a chicken would. But they're, what they're really good at is catching bugs and keeping bug populations down. So that's, that's cool to hear that it's, it's working on that. But what an abundant system that he's created here. Uh, you know, you just get to wander out into your, your land and, and eat stuff uh, as it ripens up. And uh, mulberries are one of those, those special treats, too, because uh, they do not keep well uh, in, in store shelves, at least fresh. You basically have to turn them into uh, a jam. And, and they, they have a stem that, that holds on to the, the stone. It's not like a raspberry. Like if you ever picked a raspberry, you know, you, you, there's like a, a harder part in the middle of it, and then you just pull the outer part off, and it comes, comes away clean. Makes it easily to mechanically separate. Uh, but with a mulberry, that, that stem sticks out there. So apparently not as, as desirable for customers to, to have to deal with a, a stem sticking out of their, their little piece of fruit. Um, but anyway, if, you have, you have, if you've never eaten a fresh mulberry and you happen to live in a temperate climate where they grow, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a different sort of taste. And also, they're one of the most uh, potent natural dyes, uh, at least in the, in the color purple. That, that's out there. So if you want to do any natural dyeing, you can use mulberries for that as well. Um, so that's pretty cool. But wow, just, you know, it, it, it's, it's like they're creating the, the, the fabled Garden of Eden, basically. Um, just food abundance everywhere. And every year it gets more and more lush and, and uh, developed as something to, that can sustain human life. And, and, um, and, and working on it can give you a, a, uh, a fulfilled life as well. So I, I think that's uh, it's really cool. Yes, blueberry. Do you want a blueberry? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's he loves this. He's all about this. Jen, thank you so much for yes. picking blueberries and other fruits with us. Oh, you're very welcome. It was really fun. You've got a beautiful place here. Thank you very much. Yes. We wish you guys the best. Thanks.
And you as well. Good luck on your journey. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so there you have it. So I think that's a really good illustration of, of the power that permaculture can offer any sort of leftist movement. Uh, it, it's... At its core, it's about making interconnections between people and the, and the planet that sustains them and with people and each other. And, uh, yeah, just interconnections all the way through. And the, the result of it is creating a sort of abundance that could be then transported to, or could be replicated, I should say, to any space. It could be taken to a city. It could be taken to a suburban community. It could be taken to rural land that's that's managed in a different way right now uh and the idea that especially especially for a city if we were to do this sort of management practice in say public parks uh well there's a whole lot of abundance that we could create that doesn't exist now that that doesn't take any more land that in fact requires less demands on the the hinterlands less intrusion into nature because we're we're eliminating some of the need for it, uh, for that, that way out there cultivation. And the idea then is that that space can stay wild and the space inside the city can be used for, uh, you know, it's never going to be 100% either. You'll, you'll never produce 100% of food within the city walls of any given city, but you can have it pretty close by. You can get it down to a few miles ringing a, a major city um, for, for a city like the size of, of Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, even to, you know, a couple hundred miles for very large cities, but, but still much closer than most food comes today. The average f piece of food, and uh, this is one of those statistics I haven't looked at in a while, but, but last time I did, your average piece of food travels over a thousand miles. I think it's somewhere between 1500 and 2,500 miles to make it from, uh, the place where it's grown the place where it's then sorted and, and packaged, the place where it's then taken to a warehouse and then to a, a retail space where then you pick it up and take it back home to your um, your home, uh, that's that's the mileage that it's it's traveling. So like 1,500 to, to 1,200. But we can get that down to hundreds for everybody if we manage things right. And one of those components could be doing this sort of, of practice uh, within city limits taking land that, that's being not utilized yet. And that can include balconies as well. There's so many balconies out there. In, in, even in a, a cold city like uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul, plenty of balconies available on, on all sorts of, uh, basically every high rise that goes up. That's all space that could be viewed as, as agricultural space, as well as some of the vertical space too. We could be growing vines up the sides of, of uh, the, the, you know, the enclosure that includes the, the balcony. Um, we can be growing more food within our apartments, as, as I'm trying to do. And every little bit adds up um, and also connects us in a very visceral way to the natural ecosystems that sustain us um, and the natural processes that sustain us. So, and, and, and often when you talk about things like, uh, you know, growing fruit trees along boulevards or in parks and stuff like that, people always whine about, oh, what about the waste? I, oh, I, I saw uh, uh, such and such a tree and it, it was putting out all kinds of fruit and no one was eating it. So it just made waste and it attracted bugs and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But, but all that takes is a, a, a difference in attitude. That, that's really a, a, a situation where, as Bill Mollison says, the problem is the solution. So you don't have a, a, an overabundance of food problem. You have a lack of awareness and it's uh, in some cases ability for people to properly harvest and use that food problem because a lot of public parks if you know i remember um when i was in sacramento for a while i did uh, uh, a year in americorps and we were based out of sacramento and in their downtown park in sacramento uh one of their biggest parks they had uh every tree species that grew in the state of california represented by by a specimen which included a, a bunch of different types of oranges. And I was told that they spray those oranges with, with tons of chemicals because they're there just for show, basically. Uh, and the idea being that, that no one is, is supposed to be eating these oranges. They're just there to, to look nice. But that's, I mean, that's silly when it comes down to it. 
there's no reason we couldn't just change local laws and, and allow people to uh, harvest the fruit on their own and, and eat it. You know, it's and again, not with the the aim of it being 100 percent their their daily intake of, of calories, and nutrition, but just one more supplement, one less thing they have to worry about during their day. It doesn't have to just be homeless people every either. It could be everybody. If we start to look at these collective spaces as being for the, the benefit of the entire community collectively. I think some of these ideas can can change um, with the way we do things. What's the yikes about bread crochets? Uh, anyway, um, so dec- yeah, decorative oranges, yeah, and that's sad. But but really, all it takes is is a small change in the way you perceive things, and uh, that that supposed waste can turn into abundance. And I think that's something that we should focus on as leftists: the the concept of producing abundance, and that's where permaculture has its real power. Because if we produce abundance, the more abundance we produce, let's put it that way, the the less control the current powers that be has over us. They can't threaten us with work or starve if literally there's a third option where we can at least get some of our food for a while from other sources. Uh, they can't threaten us with um, any of the things they threaten us with if we can get that those sorts of resources on our own. So that's where that, that's really where permaculture comes in because it's about creating this this it's un- unleashing abundance in all its potential. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think I think that's that's about all I wanted to say about that one. And I was, as always, if you guys had anything else you wanted to to comment on with that last video and or questions about it, we can uh, I can always help try and field those before we move on to the next one. Otherwise, I think we're just going to move on to, uh, this will probably be the final video of tonight. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be a, a good place to, to end it. Because then uh, the, the one after that, the, the Permaculture City, which I'm really excited for, uh, the video on the, the Permaculture City uh, by Toby Hemingway, who unfortunately has passed on but left a great legacy behind him, is going to be about using permaculture principles and 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 uh, ethics on city design. So I'm quite excited for that one. But that's a very long one. That's that's basically a mini documentary, hour and twelve minutes. Um, actually, that, that you know that's that's like a full length movie. Then, oh no, no, not quite a full length movie. So, whatever. Um, so, but this next one is only twenty two minutes. I think we'll get through it pretty quickly, and try to end up. Uh, right about 9.30 as we wrap things up. So this is Paul Wheaton, a uh, very famous permaculture practitioner and educator. He used to have a, a pretty good podcast called Homesteading and Permaculture with Paul Wheaton. Very knowledge-dense, very informational-dense. Uh, I think he just got frustrated that he was not getting the, the results that he wanted to and building the movement the way that he saw it should be or he thought it should be building. Uh, and he didn't, I mean, he's out in Missoula, Montana, so already it's a pretty harsh environment to grow things in there in even colder climate than, uh, the twin cities of Minnesota where I live. I think they, yeah, they're on like the, the razor edge of, of zone four, maybe even getting close to zone three, which is really cold. Plus they have droughts and they have long periods of drought in the summertime and a crazy amount of, of snow in the wintertime. So lots of different conditions to, to deal with there. But I think he was just frustrated, and that's why he stopped doing the podcast. And he also had some some issues with uh, uh, the way he would conduct himself on the podcast. He was uh, one who was not shy about eating on microphone, something that I, as a, as a person with uh, misophonia, cannot stand. I would have to rip out the headphones every time he got to a section where he was like sloppily chewing into the microphone. It just drove me crazy. Uh, and then people would complain about it and he would do it even more just as an FU to them, which I really didn't think was a good way to build his movement that he seemed so desperate to build. Um, so we had some issues with that too. But uh, anyway, still does great work out in Missoula, uh, a, a wonderful fountain of information. And one of his big things was 
what's called the the rocket mass heater. We'll click on that. And there's been a real second. There's there's Paul Wheaton himself. Um, the rocket mass heater. Uh, well, if he doesn't describe it, then then I'll go into more detail about what exactly it is. But but he's going to talk about how to use this super efficient system where the byproducts are the, the, what's coming out the chimney basically is only carbon dioxide and a little bit of steam because no wood is, is perfectly dry. And then you can heat your whole house and in a way that, that catches and stores energy and re releases it slowly over the course of the night. And, you know, subsequently you have to use a lot less than you would in like, you know, those, those Franklin type burning wood burning stoves or anything like that. So uh, take it away, Paul. And a lot of people that had a conventional wood stove and then they switched to a rocket mass heater and then um, the reports are generally uh, anywhere from one-fifth the wood to one-tenth the wood. We're at a very special place today on the Great American Farm Tour. Wheaton Labs in Montana. Paul Wheaton himself sitting next to a legit huger bed. A lot of people build these too small. I don't think you lack a smallness here. And he's a giant. <laughs> now, Extra I you, large! <laughs> I know you're a bear now. Are you a, a teddy bear or a grizzly bear? Definitely a grizzly bear. Okay. Don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. <laughs> okay. I am not a sweet person. Uh, <laughs> don't. You want sweet, you talk to Justin. That's right, that's right. He's not hiding anything here, okay, folks? <laughs> All right, grizzly, show we us around, buddy. We need a boy for size. We need a boy for perspective. Stand right there. Give him an idea. <laughs> See, look. Look how big it is now. Nice. It got so much bigger. So we have a road over there. And every time I stood out here, it was sucking my soul away. So what I did was I deleted the road. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. And Keep so it reduces the sound about 90%. Definitely reduces the visual 100%. And we grow things on it. Good job. Now, so far, this has been about two and a half years. And we have not irrigated it at all. Although we put some water on it this year because um, we were worried about some forest fires in the area. Okay. So um, uh, we had, we actually had like little embers showing up about that big and we're like, hey, let's put water on things that are less likely to catch on fire. <laughs> so, but uh, the rhubarbs have been very, very happy, some happy potatoes and, uh, and other things. And then because they're so steep and it's got hugel culture bits inside. So it's got wood on the inside. And as the wood rots, it'll become parking spaces for water and nutrients to grow all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so uh, if you remember, I mentioned Hugelkultur. It's a very tough word to say. It's a German word. Uh, Hugelkultur, H-U-G-E-L-K-U-L-T-U-R-E. That's Hugelkultur. And it's just a core of wood with earth over the top of it. And like he says, once that, that wood breaks down, the really nice thing about it is it acts like a sponge. It's like a, 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 a bio sponge. I mean, sponges actually are living things to begin with, but, but it's like a, a sponge of the land. So the, the water filtrates in and it gets trapped in all this, this woody pulpy material that's broken down. And, uh, and then again, releases it slowly over the course of time. But right now, what we've learned so far is that there hasn't been enough moisture in the mound for that wood to really rot well. So I think next year we might actually water it. But eventually, once it gets old enough and rotten enough, then we won't need, we can have the most luxuriant garden we want and we don't have to irrigate it at all. Yay. Let's go look at a rocket mass heater okay. in the library. Many of you may know him for a rocket mass heater. I'm really interested in seeing this. This is our steampunk rocket mass heater of science. For those that are not familiar with a rocket mass heater, the idea is, is to burn your fire, not in a metal box, which throws off the heat right away, but to burn it in a very insulated box. So the fire gets crazy hot. That burns all the creosote and the smoke. So normally what you do is you put your sticks in here the fire burns at the bottom of the sticks and burns sideways and there's a super insulated chimney inside of this it okay so are you guys having an easy time visualizing what's happening here so you, you have uh, a vertical box that you stick your your pieces of wood down into this is this is what's known as a, a a J feeder, I believe. So it looks like a J. So you have the vertical box that goes down and then it burns, you burn it from the bottom. So it's like a self feeding thing. So as the fire keeps uh, moving up the log, it gets lower, you know, it, it feeds itself down into that spot. So you don't have to keep tending it all the time. That's one of the features of it. And then it goes down up into this, this barrel that you see um, that he's about to show about. And uh, 
yeah, he'll explain it from there. It hits the top of the barrel, goes down the sides, and then does a double loop-de-loop. -loop. Okay, so was that clear? So you have it coming down this J form. So you have the small chute that goes down, and then it comes up this pipe, and just before it gets to the top, and you, you have to adjust that, that distance between the top of the, the internal pipe and that barrel so it's just right, so it's getting the right mix of oxygen and, and heat um, and fuel all at the same time that you have a, a really well burning fire in there. And then it, it forms what's called a toro. So basically it, it goes up, it mushrooms out, and it comes back down along the sides of that tube that it comes up in initially, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's coming up the J tube into the barrel and like basically a donut all the way around, coming all the way down and then going into the, the mass. And then he'll talk about the purpose of the mass at that point. Before going up what? and out the roof. It really works. Really works. Oh, I guess he, he skimmed over that real quick. So that, that, uh, that stuff that you see to his left there, that all is basically the mass. So it's stuff that absorbs the heat and over time, it absorbs, it, it, it's like if you've ever used a cast iron pan before, it can be slower to heat up than, than your thinner metal stuff. But once that cast iron pan gets hot, it gets hot very evenly and it takes a long time for it to cool down. It really absorbs the heat slowly, but it holds on to it and re-radiates it very slowly as well. And that's the idea. So you're, you're heating up this mass slowly, but um, very efficiently with as much heat as you can throw at it all at once and it's absorbing into there so that even after the fire goes out it's going to be radiating heat back into that room and keeping it relatively the same temperature even after the fire's gone so that's one reason you need a lot less wood for it and then it just goes out that that stovepipe there and this particular room that we're in um, is not sealed it, uh, the air moves through here really easy. You can see outdoors in a lot of different places. <laughs> um, I think that we heat this space with probably a cord and a half each winter. What? So this is it. This is the size of wood you put in there. Yeah. That's nothing. Which is normal length yeah. for um, a standard conventional wood stove. Okay. And you could use bigger chunks, but I like to use smaller chunks. I yeah. like, I, well, like that. So put it in here. Put it in here like you're going to start a fire. Okay. And that's it. These little so tiny woods. So how much? The hole in there is about this big, so I'd put like, I don't know, six sticks like this in like that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and the bottom burns. Mm -hmm. The fire burns sideways. It goes up the heat riser that's like this in there. And then hits the top, goes down the sides, double loop-de-loop -loop out the roof. So now that what comes out the roof is just steam and CO2. Wow. And then when, when we go outside, we like, and it'll hold heat for a good day. This one holds it for a good day. The other With one will hold it for a couple of days. Of wood? Six little With, sticks of wood. That's uh, for a, day. a day. Oh, not for oh, a whole okay. day. Okay. okay. Now, when we get into but the. But when the fire is done, the, the, the stove will remain its heat. Yes. Okay. Now, the one in the house is better than this one. Okay. And it'll hold the heat for days. Uh, and we've done that many times. Okay. And we'll run a fire for, like, in, out here we'll run a fire for maybe maybe an hour and a half, but every day. And then in the house, we'll run the fire for an hour and a half, maybe hour, hour to an hour and a half, for uh, every other day. And it's just Montana, it's not South Carolina. No. Yeah. So how cold does it get, Paul? Uh, I think last winter, did it get to 10 below, guys? I said it got down to 20 below. 20 below this last winter? So actually, what what he just said there, down to about 20 below, that's Fahrenheit. Uh, sorry, I don't know the, the Celsius conversion, but that, that's actually the, the similar climate to what I'm in right now. So maybe he is looking at a similar climate zone, but still he has other climatic factors like uh, very little uh, rain during the summer and, uh, and probably more snow during the winter. So a little bit harsher environment still than where I'm at. All right, guys. Hey, hey, hey. We're trying to be hey, quick. Quick, you? act like you're working. <laughs> I'm eating. I'm always playing. Well, hey. We call this house the Fisher Price House because it's just a plastic double wide house. You could find it in any children's aisle at the, <laughs> at the department store. We tried to build this one with a slightly different aesthetic. So it's got a granite top. It's got gravel on the inside, pea gravel. But here you can see the wood feed. 
So, so again, that pea gravel he was mentioning, that's the mass. That's the thing that, that holds the heat in and re-radiates it out slowly. Another application for this sort of thermal mass is for passive solar. So you, if you orient your windows towards the sun, whichever direction that is during the noonday hour uh, in your climate and your hemisphere, if you orient your windows towards the south predominantly, and then you have them shining in when the sun is at its, its, its highest angle and its most uh, penetrative and, and warming stage, if you have it shining onto something that can, that can itself act like that pea gravel and slowly collect and hold on to that heat and then re-radiate it throughout the night, that's what's known as, as a thermal mass for passive solar. So it works with fire and it works just with passive solar too. But we could be designing our cities around this sort of a, a, a system. And, you know, they often talk about, if you know, critics of, of using wood-burning stoves. They, they talk about uh, how London was just full of soot and, uh, uh, and, and you know, the, the new world in America was just full of soot when people relied on, on fireplaces. That's because they were doing inefficient burns with modern, and modern's, a, you know, kind of in air quotes, but modern thinking and, and uh, a modern application of this pretty standard technology we can make that efficiency go through the roof to the point where if, he, if what he says is true and all it's putting out is steam and carbon dioxide, that's no much more, that's not any more exhaust than, say, a propane heater uh, for your house or, or whatever form of heat you have now uh, is putting out into the, the atmosphere. Um, so it, it's a way that you can think, you can design things to be smarter uh, not just more complex, right? It doesn't take a, a tremendous amount of complexity to solve a lot of these problems um, in ways that, that are still appropriate for a variety of applications, including urban living. Um, it's, it's definitely possible that you could heat apartments using this sort of a method. You definitely have to be a lot more careful about uh, the way you, the materials you use to uh, build these systems. You can't just be doing all stick frame and hope that it all works out for the best. You, you have to then contend with the, the new element of, of fire being used more often. But, you know, we have modern building techniques as well that we can use to, uh, you know, dissipate any sort of potential damage that, that using and relying on wood-burning stoves might have in, a, say, an apartment complex. And that's where we put the wood in, and you can see it's not very big. It's pretty small. And then um, we use this to kind of clean out the ash and dump the ash in here before each burn. And then when the fire is done, we just kind of move the bricks. Yeah, and so that, that little bit of ash, that's all the system produces. And it's because you have to have some, some sort of tinder to, to get the whole thing going. You, you can't just, you know, put your lighter up underneath a, a, a piece of uh, wood and, and hope that it's going to light up. So it does take a little bit to prime the system too, because you want the, the airflow to be uh, in, the, in the right direction. You don't want to have what's known as competing chimneys where smoke may be coming out of one end or the other, depending on which end is, is, high, is hottest and which end the heat is, is naturally you know, pushing itself through. Um, but you do need a little bit to get it going. So that's, that's all that ash is from, is that little bit of paper or other sort of kindling just to get the system started back over the hole mm. to slow any air movement but this one has a stainless steel barrel a lot of people build rocket mass heaters and they don't use a barrel at all they, they'll have something else that's manufactured they feel like having a barrel in their home is not a pretty thing um well you prefied this how'd you prefy that um time oh really yeah. it was it looks like brass it was a plain stainless steel barrel and over time it picked up its own okay funky coloring Okay, and it looks really nice. It does, doesn't it? It did that all on its own. That's nature. Yeah. <laughs> nature. Totally nature. But this one <clears throat> has a bunch of magical properties to it. Uh, this might be the rockediest rocket mass heater ever built. <laughs> uh, it was, when we finished building it, it was so rockety that when we put the wood in, it sucked the flames off of the wood and put the fire out. So we uh, reduced the size of the wood feed. So this, this wood feed's smaller 
than what it started off as. Um, it's, it's about 35% smaller than what would normally be used. But because that's smaller than, it, than the, uh, we have a normal fire, we also added another loop-de-loop. -loop. Just another little aside, the reason it's called a rocket mass heater is because it has the two elements of the rocket heater, which is that those first two stages, the, the barrel and the, the wood feed, and then the mass part. So the rocket heater gets its name because it's burning so fast and so efficiently that it's pulling the air. Like you says, it's pulling the air across the, the wood so fast that it sounds like a rocket as it's, as it's burning. Um, that's how fast and efficient it goes. Like you think of having a, a fire in just a, a normal fireplace. It's just kind of low and lazy and, and um, you know, it, it, it doesn't produce. <laughs> it's not sucking it out so fast that it's, it's producing that sort of a... A, a flame and a sound inside to kind of slow things down a little bit. Another interesting thing about this one is that um, we had a lot of people that were kind of like all the numbers with rocket mass heaters were too rough for them. They were feeling like you can't believe it because no one has held a ruler up to it. So um, in this space, this is a three bedroom home and we don't have uh, stuff on the windows like um, curtains, heavy curtains, like winter curtains. Uh, nor do we have like a mudroom off the front door. So you open the door, it's wide open to the outside. These are ways that you normally save energy. So we don't have that kind of energy saving stuff here. Whenever the temperature got to be about 66, that was cold enough that we built a fire. And it's like, okay, that's too cold. So 66. And then usually we got the temperature over 70. And then what would happen is rather than like, we are logically going to stop burning the fire, what happened was, is we got lazy and forgot about the fire. <laughs> and so we kept it between 66 and 71 all winter. And uh, we used 0 0.6 cords of wood. And for a house like this in Montana, in this climate, a normal wood stove would probably use six cords of wood. And Listen to that. That's like, that's almost a, a little more than one twelfth of the, the normal wood that you would need to use to to heat a place like that that's just incredible um so so when we when we get to these levels of efficiency uh using wood especially since there's scrap wood to be had around uh for the manufacturing of other things uh becomes a much more attractive option uh, it's not necessarily going backwards down the the, the carbon ladder uh as as the uh advocates of of solar voltaic and, and so forth uh, warn against, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing to consider wood again as a potential heat source if it can be, you know, so lightly used in comparison to how it was in the past. It's definitely another option to, to be considered uh, as part of the toolbox of building and, and designing new places. And there's been a lot of people that had a conventional wood stove and then they switched to a rocket mass heater. And then um, the reports are generally uh, anywhere from one fifth the wood to one tenth the wood with the switch. Yeah. Woo. So, uh, and usually when they say one fifth the wood, it's because they switched from a super efficient wood yeah. stove to a rocket mass I, heater. Uh, <sighs> These are incredibly safe. Um, when you heat with one-tenth the wood, you have one-tenth the fire, one-tenth the opportunity. And then all the flamey bits are inside a very insulated space, much more difficult for any kind of disaster. Plus, the main disaster that you insure against is going to be creosote fires. And these don't have creosote. They burn all the creosote because they get it so hot. So it's like these are so much safer. And then they pump out heat when there's no fire, and that's super safe. So um, not to mention the fact that they're far more luxuriant because with a conventional wood stove, the fire goes out at night and then people are either getting up at two o'clock in the morning to build a new fire or else they're getting up and maybe their pipes are frozen or something like that. So with this, uh, we'll run a fire in here. We'll go to bed and it'll be like 72. We'll wake up and it'll be 69. So it holds mm. the heat for quite a long time. All right, should we, let's go back out this way and that way. Somebody asked me if they should like not put their laundry out while you were here. And I said, <laughs> no man, that's our eco flag. That's we're right. proud to dry our clothes outdoors. Hang that eco flag, wave it proudly. Underwear and all. 
Sure, is there underwear up there? No, they took your underwear away. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and, and there you have another appropriate piece of technology that at one time was even used in the cities. I mean, you've probably seen like cartoons or old movies or, or something like that where especially in the, the when the poorer parts of town are depicted, there's laundry lines that string them between the buildings. And I mean, that that's literally something that we can do again. Uh, although in, in most major cities now, there's ordinances against it because it's seen as unsightly uh, to, to air your clean laundry out. Um, and, but at the same time, it's, it's free energy that's available that can work uh, even in the winter time to dry things rather than use all the, the gas or electricity that we currently use. So I think it really just takes a reframing of, of the situation and what is appropriate. And uh, we could have that, that sort of a system again. Uh, and it'd be just one more piece where we are reducing rather than just switching the, the, the type of energy we use we're literally reducing our need for more uh, human produced energy and just relying on the sun and its natural cycles to do the work for us. Uh, and I think that's a critical thing that's missing from a lot of ecological sort of perspectives. They, they focus on photovoltaics, which is, is solar panels and wind turbines and uh you know even like micro hydro uh, you know all these sorts of things what they almost never seem to get to is technologies that reduce our dependency on generating uh new electricity or 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 heat uh energy at all you know that never seems to really enter into the equation other than say like energy efficient appliances and that sort of thing but beyond that, that, that's where the energy reduction seems to come to a halt. But there's so many appropriate technologies where we could be using less energy in the first place. Solar water heaters, passive solar, rocket mass heaters. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, that, that still is a source of energy, but it's a, a more renewable one than even photovoltaics, if properly managed and used lightly enough our forest could last and be sustainable forever uh, because it literally is just stored uh, sunlight. It's just that it happens to form a lot more quickly than the stored sunlight of, of oil and other um, so-called fossil fuels uh, accumulate. It, it stores it more quickly. So properly managed, we can treat that as more of a renewable resource. Uh, and it's another potential heat source that reduces our need for electricity and gas. Um, and these sorts of appropriate technologies are, are bridges to get to that sort of a, a level of system efficiency. But I, I think any eco-movement worth its salt needs to be talking more on using appropriate technologies that reduce the amount that we're dependent on gas and electricity. Um, for our daily energy needs. I think that if you don't have one of these, are, are you really living off grid? <laughs> are you really eco? Are you really, do you really care about the earth if you don't have a clothesline? Propane is off grid's dirty little secret. <laughs> if you've got propane, you're not really off grid. That's our other property. <laughs> are you on the grid grid? This property is definitely on the grid. Look, there's the grid. See it? There it goes. It's the grid. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> it's coming right for you. <laughs> hey, Mr. Brown, is he a teddy bear or a grizzly bear? Grizzly bear. Grizzly bear. <laughs> is he going to eat you? No. No? We call this Willow Wonka. And so it's something that we have. We call it a willow feeder. Um, <clears throat> It's not a composting toilet, but it could be modified pretty easily to be a composting toilet. Uh, but rather, a lot of people say that there is this such a thing as waste. And in permaculture, we try to say, you know, waste from one system is the feed for another system kind of a thing. So rather than saying it's, you know, for waste, what we do is we say that it's a willow feeder because willow trees love that stuff. That's, that's their candy. They're like, no, give me all of that. 
Now, a lot of trees, if you take the material that's deposited in here and you try to give it to some other plant or tree, most plants and trees are going to be like, ugh, that's, that's too much. But a willow tree will take it, so will a poplar or a cottonwood. So we call these willow feeders. Um, what we're looking at right here is the trom wall. So there is a pipe, which you can almost see. No, that's not the pipe. The pipe's in the middle, and you can't see it anywhere in here. But there's a pipe in there. And so this is a cob mass. <coughs> and this is mostly black behind glass. So it gets very, very hot. Then the cob mass holds the heat for a long time. And then that keeps the air moving through that pipe. And as long as that air is moving through that pipe, then it's sucking air out of the chamber inside of there. And then that would mean that when you go in there and you go like this, <laughs> as opposed to sometimes you stop off at something that the state has provided or someplace else has provided and you go, oh, oh, oh which is different. Notice, notice the different way, you know. So we, we wanted not the second one, but the first one. I can see here it says open and there's just magnets holding that closed. So you just give it a tug and it opens oh, right up. Nice. Very nice. It's like you're on a throne up there. I think some people call it a throne. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You just need a window here so you can bark your orders. And then people bark back. <laughs> it's, it's like the barking back people, I decided to take the window out. Very nice. Let's do it. Let's take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. <sighs> smells nice. It's working. There's the pipe. Pulling it out. Drawing it out with just natural heat draw from the black artwork. Very nice. You like to sit on this drone and go to... So there are even systems similar to this that I've seen where instead of just venting all that gas, they take that naturally occurring methane as your waste product is broken down by the microbes uh, and they uh, capture it. They capture that methane and then they can use it in place of natural gas. And uh, so you're, you're taking what, again, was a waste product and turning it into just a product that you can use. And it's pretty cool. And, and so the thing with the, the willow, though, is that, yeah, like he says, willows are heavy feeders to the point where a lot of people uh, don't like to have them in their yards in, in, say, suburbia because they tend to find those sewer lines and break in. They find sewer lines and water lines and they're like, ooh, resources. And somehow they... they uh, you know, they, they worm their roots right in there and they will just start sucking all that sewage. But eventually it gets to the point where it, it clogs the, the drain and, uh, or breaks the, the pipe in a way that, that water's not flowing correctly. And, uh, you have a problem on your hands. So that's why people tend not to like them, but in their proper place, they can be used to do some really wonderful things. Uh, some free services, free ecological services for you. And that's, that's the idea of working with nature instead of against nature and and making the problem the solution so instead of having a, a a problem of a plant that craves so much nutrition that it will uh get into places it's not supposed to be you put it in a place where it has virtually unlimited access to nutrients and it will just do its thing and happily dispose of a what otherwise would be a waste product for you go to the bathroom this is pretty new so we've no. got some more testing to do and some modifications to make to it okay this is our third one and up there is the second one. Now the second one used to be down here and much like you just suggested, like, oh, you need some windows. So it did allow people to kind of look around. Like when you sit down in there, you, there'd be like, you could see. And the problem was, is that if somebody was walking by, you would make eye contact. That's awkward. And that would get the whole system to stop. <laughs> So we learned it was not helping with what the function was. We weren't feeding the willow trees anymore when somebody would walk by. That we learned. This is all about experimentation. We learned a valuable lesson. So, so we, we modified it. We moved it up there. And, and of course he's joking, but that literally is what observe and interact, the permaculture principle, is all about. It's about not just having things be theoretical indefinitely and, and modifying your theories to... to fit other theories and on and on and on and never really testing it. It's about doing both. It's about coming up with a, a theory or, or really a, a hypothesis. Theory is not a, the, the correct scientific term, but coming up with a hypothesis about what you think might happen and then testing it out in small ways so that if it fails, it's not a catastrophe. And if it succeeds, you can replicate it and, and bring it on to 
uh, into other applications and other spaces. Um, so, so, so he's employing observe and interact when he redesigns these, these sorts of outhouses. Hit it behind trees, put it at, like the, at a dead end, and added more wood around the sides. So now you got triple layer protection to make sure that you don't... <laughs> the other thing is, is that uh, you'll notice that this is, this is the floor above the skids. And you'll notice it's also on skids. We can move this around whenever we want. But on the other ones, this is the first time where we added a floor up high. On the other ones, we added a little box or something that you can put your feet on while you're at work. Hey, Working, yeah, doing doing what you need to be doing. Uh, and we kind of feel like having an actual floor is more luxuriant. Mm, so nice. Now, uh, the other thing is, is that the one up there, which we call Willow Bank, uh, that one has two seats. Uh, and um, we realized that that design was a poor design because what would happen is, is whenever people would come in there, and they'd be hard at work, they would see the other seat, and then that would kind of help clench things up too, because you think any moment now, somebody's gonna come up here. I know I'd latched the door and everything, but is somebody gonna be out there angry saying, hey, I know there's a second seat in there, you gotta let me in. And you know, so there's that whole, uh, and the reason why we did it to have two seats is not because we wanted two people in there at the same time. One side had a urine diverter and the other side didn't. Mm. And so then um, some, most, mostly women, uh, appreciate a urine diverter because when they're working, then everything's going. And then with guys, they can choose. I've decided to do this job, but not this job. And, um, but then if there's a urine diverter there, then it's like, I don't want my stuff to touch that. Mm. <laughs> so we made one side without and one side with. And now what we've done is we've just made a much better urine diverter. <laughs> and there's just one hole because people nice. were getting kind of, that, they were getting nervous about that second hole up, up here. <laughs> <clears throat> I've seen a lot of the old time outhouses with two holes, but it wasn't urine diverter reasoning, was it? It's, it's stop being such a weenie, get in there. That's right. And stop your the old whining. Timers. Yeah. Didn't have the same concerns. Yeah, yeah, it was a different era. <laughs> it was a different, everything was different then. Get in there, do what you gotta do, and get out. Don't be looking around. Don't be starting <laughs> conversations. Just do what you gotta do. And so uh, uh, I think that uh, today, I know I wouldn't want to be in that kind of no, situation. Totally. I like the idea that I've got privacy and and um, you know I can think. I can you know yeah take my time, get it done right, do a good job. So and and. In case you're wondering, the reason that you have a urine diverter at all is because of uh, it, having them both at the same, going to the same place can can throw off the um, the way that it's broken down. Uh, I don't know the exact science of it, but basically you want to separate your, your solids from your liquids and uh, you'll have a better composting situation. So that that's the reason for that sort of a, an attachment. Both of these are on skids. In fact, both of these structures used to be down there and we decided to move them up here. And so we just drug them up here. No problem. This is Willow Bank. Two-seater, already described the two seats. Now this is one where um, we kind of thought, all right, we needed it in the short term. So we made this one in two days and, and we had an event. And so we needed something that's like, I didn't want to have a porta potty. So we got this here, and sure enough, people liked this 10 times, 20 times better than a porta potty. But people would still prefer to go into the house if they could. So then we talked about how can we modify this so people would rather come in here than go in the house. And so I think we went through seven iterations of modifications to, to get to where um, we have this. So we've got um, in the morning, the sun comes up on this side. And there's little marbles there, and they put like little designs all over the place. Um, usually there's lots of artwork all over the chalkboard. And uh, if you step on that pedal, it'll make the water come out right here. Really, yeah, step on that pedal. Step on that little pedal right there. There it is. <clears throat> so there's a sink out there. <clears throat> Oh, that's probably enough. That's good, Lily. That's good, Lily. <laughs> There's not a lot of water in there. Just so. Don't need to empty it. 
because we, we, we pack the water in for it. Um, but, you know, when we talked about how to make it more luxuriant, we talked about how uh, some women occasionally will need to come in here and um, somewhere we've got a little, there it is, right there. There's 12 different ways to deal with Shark Week. And, and so then it's like, okay, how do you deal with Shark Week when you're here? This is a new environment. Then the other thing is, is like, okay, let's say you've now dealt with Shark Week. And then, and then you're kind of... Guessing you can figure out what he means by Shark Week. Uh, when you're talking about issues that women would have, or not just women, but anyone who menstruates would have uh, basically once a month. So that, that's what he means by, by Shark Week, in case you were confused. I've left like this. Then do you want to like go outside and use the sink out there? Or look, a sink right here. Then when you exit, you're not doing this. So if you listen carefully, can you hear it? The little fan. There's a solar panel on that side. And um, the design of this one is that uh, we've got a battery and a, and a tiny little fan instead of using the trauma mall down there. And what we've learned is, is that this battery will last maybe five years and then it's shot and then it has to be replaced. Um, and maybe the fan will need to be replaced and maybe the solar panel will need to be replaced. Maybe the wiring will need to be repaired. It's not a passive system. It's gonna require maintenance. So we, we decided that we wanted to, you know, experiment more with the Trom wall and get a, get a Trom wall design that works extremely well. Um, so that Trom wall is far more elaborate then, because um, our first willow feeder has a trom wall in it, and it works like 90% of the time. So, a trom wall. No, it's a, a trom wall. I don't actually know what that is, so I would have to look that up. What we decided to do is make a much better trom wall and try that. It's so hot off the press. Willow Wonka is just recently done. We need we need people to test it more. All right, and you notice how we got the little steps in here to put the feet on, you know? Because when when you it turns out that if you don't have this here. That, that, that will interfere with uh, the work that you need to do. It, it turns out your legs need to be lifted just a little bit up off the ground, a little bit. So of all the things that I'm showing you here, uh, it's like maybe 5% of it, maybe 4% of it was actually made by me. This okay. is all community stuff. Really, everybody else doing nearly all the work. I'm just a fat guy who s sits in an office most of the time while we're here. But what you've seen so far is only half. Uh, wow. This is the black thing on the outside. Oh, oh yeah, I think you are right. The, the, uh, the passive solar um, fan system or venting system. I think you are right about that. Good, good call there. It's just base camp um, where it's one job. So, so that's what the, the trom wall. I don't know the spelling, I'd have to look that up, but yeah, trauma. Giant rock. We go over to the lab and we've got 40 foot deep subsoil and we can grow so much more. And we've got the two Wafatis up there. Each one has a, a beautiful rocket mass heater in it, which is featured in Ernie and Erica's book, uh, The Rocket Mass Heater Builder's Guide. Then we've got the teepee that has a rocket mass heater in it. Uh, and then both of those are featured in our uh, eight DVD set. Uh, and there's there's one DVD that you could buy just by itself, the Cobb style DVD, and that's got the TP and the Wafati builds in it. But those are up at the lab. Um, Ant Village is up at the lab. Uh, there's there's and there's all the projects that those guys have done. Um, there's just much much more to see. If if anybody is interested in coming here and checking out what we're doing, or you know hanging out for a, a tour, or maybe a few days or a week or something, go to permies.com slash labs that's not how you spell that uh permies.com is p-e-r-m-i-e-s dot com uh and that and that's where you can find his entire forum that he runs on permaculture and jumping off points through his podcast and all the other videos and work that he's done so if you're interested in paul wheaton's work and uh maybe going out there yourself uh but be aware that he runs things the way that he wants them run uh, he, he has a lot of volunteer work, uh, that, that gets done. Um, uh, but basically if you don't fall into, uh, his way of doing things, then he's, um, he's not, not going to keep you around, especially in, in certain lifestyle choices, such as if you, uh, do drugs of any kind, he kicks people off immediately. He, he likes to mention the story a lot where, Someone came to his uh, property 
and dropped his bag down. A joint rolled out, and he was off the property within the next hour and never allowed to return. He has a zero tolerance policy. His reasoning is that it puts his entire operation in danger uh, for something that you're just doing for yourself and your own pleasure. Uh, but yeah, so if you have any sort of a need for, for that sort of thing, then Paul Wheaton is not the guy for you, uh, not, the, not the person to collaborate with. Um, and also, I get the feeling that uh, he allows you to live there uh, in exchange for the work that you do. So in many ways, he is kind of acting as, as a landlord, but he's also a landlord that knows a hell of a lot and probably is going to give you a lot of free education as you're there. So in certain ways, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, but I don't know all this for sure. This, these are just my assumptions, having followed his, his career and his, his style uh, over about a five to, to eight year period uh, when he was doing his podcast. Uh, but he's definitely a wealth of information. He puts a lot of this stuff out for free on online. Um, and then he holds permaculture design courses. Uh, I don't know how often he has them anymore, but uh, you can probably find that on permies.com as well. Um, and they also have a Facebook presence. Not quite as active, but but it's there. Um, and yeah, you, so you, can see, you can search out his stuff in other places. But let's wrap up this video and then we'll wrap up the stream for the night for dvds and stuff i think that uh, if you go to richsoil.com that's where i keep most of that stuff uh i think uh, richsoil.com slash yeah richsoil.com is another good site to to check out his work and his empire of of stuff he started out as a coder and a website developer um so he has a lot of interesting online resources still um but he also does stuff of course as you can see in the real world quite often uh wood heat uh, is, is where we've got the stuff about the 8 DVD set. Um, World Domination Gardening, the Permaculture Playing Cards. I think if you go to permies.com slash PDC, you can get 177 hours of video that's our permaculture design course and our appropriate technology course. I'm sure we've got a bunch of other things. We've got the whole digital market. A lot of our famous authors are offering their books at the permies.com digital market. Thank you for this tour, it's absolutely great. I love your consistent build here. Just reusing wood and making it beautiful. Good job. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Thanks, Justin. So there you have it. There's uh, there's a little bit about a, a lot of different permaculture systems all rolled into one. I didn't, I hadn't actually seen the entirety of this video yet. So uh, yeah, that's some cool techniques to to ponder and check out and. Maybe even think about how they might fit into your own situation, however that might be, or how they might not, but but what you could possibly learn from them anyway. Uh, Mike Hogue, who I had on last week, was talking a lot about how even if, you know, say like uh, Earthworks, like the, he, he likes the nurse log a lot, uh, as, as you may recall, even if that's not something that's appropriate for your particular area, you can still take uh, that as more of an abstract concept and apply it to your life and think about how you could be setting down uh, nurse logs that, that uh, attract to you naturally, the, the sorts of things that, that you want for your life. You know, what, what are some systems that you can set in place that, that can be seen as uh, metaphorical nurse logs and stuff like that. So I think the same can be said about a lot of these systems, whether or not you like them or, or think they're directly applicable to your situation. There's a lot of uh, perhaps metaphorical ideas that, that could come from them and more abstract concepts that you could still take from them and uh, profit yourself. Um, but I think that's going to be about it that we're going to do this week. I'm going to scroll you down just a bit here. So we're going to take a, a preview of what we're going to look at next time. You can always go to my, my YouTube channel. So I'm going to show you my YouTube channel right now so you can see my back archive. Uh, yeah, you look for Bread Theory. I'm that's my YouTube channel there. You can go check out and you can see my entire catalog of videos. I have just gotten up to putting out my Principles of Communism Part 2. I'm going to work on putting out some more videos tomorrow so we can get closer to uh, the present day because I'm all the way into State and Revolution already. This will be the, the third installment this upcoming Wednesday. Um, so I'm going to work on getting caught up. I'm only on, I've only put out up to Permaculture Part 4 which you can find in my playlists. Um, 
So I, I like using playlists a lot to organize things. So my entire Permaculture 101 set so far, up to four. And, and now we're up to eight, so I got a lot of uh, editing to do to, to catch up. Um, and you can see all my, but you can see all my shows as far as I've put them out. And eventually they'll, they'll all be out. Anyway, there, there's a playlist that, that is this playlist that I'm drawing from to, to do these videos. And it's called LSB TV on Permaculture. And that's the, the playlist that I've been drawing on. Um, so you can see all the videos that I use for that. Look ahead, you can go back and if you've missed some of them and you want to just go over the material on your own, it's all available right there. It's a, it's a public list. So coming up, we just finished the one with Paul Wheaton. Interesting character, I must say. Uh, and then we're going to go into the, the mini documentary on the Permaculture City with Toby Hemingway next time, next week. Um, should be the same about the same time on Sunday next week, uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll get Toby Hemingway's take on the Permaculture City, and that's going to be a real interesting one because that's going to blend together new urbanism and uh, permaculture much more so than, than the videos we've seen so far. So if you live in the city, this is definitely the one to, to catch next week. So that's going to do it for tonight. I encourage you all to check out my link tree, l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory. You can find links to, to all my different stuff. So you got the Twitch, of course, YouTube, podcast. I put out the audio of the YouTube, so that's the edited version of these streams, as a podcast. And you can find me on Facebook, where I will I do my posting about the show, as well as put out memes and other fun stuff I find. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, you can buy my art. And then there's the Left Signal Boost database, if you're interested in finding other leftist creators in virtually any platform you can think of. There is my two uh, Facebook groups that I manage, Left Pod Posting, which focuses more or less on, on leftist podcasters, but it's, it's pretty loose. We do memes and all sorts of leftist fun stuff as well as that. Um, and then Left Single Boost, which is just a, a general place to boost leftist uh, creators of, of every type and on every platform. And you can find me on Goodreads and see what I'm reading and... Uh, you know, friend me there if you're so inclined. So that's my my uh, link tree right there. And that's the best way to find me. You know what? I think I'll, I will choose the Reed Army for tonight. So thank you very much, Bread Crochets, for the suggestion. And we will raid out into them.